uh, and uh, thank you all for coming out today. Uh, filling in for about five minutes for uh, co-chair uh, Representative Mike Sterla from Lancaster County. Uh, we'll now call this Basic Education Funding Commission hearing to order uh, for everyone's information. Uh, this meeting is being recorded and streamed live online. And Vicki, if you would be so kind to call the roll. Where is Vicki? We're going to get started in a minute. Hi, Vicki. <laughs> Ms. Wilkin, uh, Senator Argyle is waiting to be let in on Zoom. Um, he, he is, uh, so he is present, uh, but cannot respond. So hopefully our tech people can get that taken care of. We have a nod in the back. <laughs> Fantastic, thank you. <laughs> That's as official as we get. Nods in the bed. That's actually how we're going to vote at the end. So. Here. 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 On behalf of uh, Chair Sterla, we will now enter testimony from the Pennsylvania Association of School Nurses and Practitioners into this hearing's records. Uh, to our co-chair, Senator Kristen Phillips Hill, would, do you have any opening remarks? Would you like to say anything? Thank you so much. Um, Ms. Wilkin, I would like to have the record reflect that Representative Ryan Warner from Fayette County is attending virtually and said that he is not able to hear uh, the roll call, but is present. So um, thank you again, Representative Schweier, Representative Sterla, and of course our host, State Senator Lindsey Williams, for hosting this meeting here today in her district. Um, we are very grateful to Pittsburgh Public Schools for having us at this really unique facility and want to give a big shout out to all of the students who made a beautiful breakfast um, here uh, at their CTE school for everyone to enjoy. Really appreciate it. Today is the seventh meeting of this commission since we started taking our hearings on the road to hear from stakeholders all across the state and we have a packed agenda. So I want to turn it over to our host, State Senator Lindsey Williams. Thank you, Chairwoman. Um, good morning and welcome to Senate District 38. I want to thank Pittsburgh Public Schools and the students, teachers, and staff at Westinghouse for hosting us this morning, particularly the facility staff who came in here last night and got this all set up, and the culinary arts students who made us that delicious breakfast. Thank you to Sylvia Wilson, who's our school board member, who's here with us. Um, I'd also like to thank my staff and the caucus staff who are here for all the work that's gone into today. There's a lot of behind the scenes work to make this possible and they've done an amazing job. Um, and of course, thank you to the testifiers who will be with us today, even for veteran educators and policy experts preparing testimony um, for a panel of legislators can be a little nerve wracking. So I appreciate the time and effort you put into your testimony. Um, today we are in the emergency response technology program here at Westinghouse. Um, it started in 2017 and in my prior life with the Pittsburgh Federation of Teachers, I was actually at the advisory board meeting where this idea came up and it was suggested that we, need a, we needed a program to grow our own uh, of police, fire, and EMS. And it started with a grant from the Pittsburgh Teachers Union and in cooperation with the city who donated the vehicles that you see around the room. And the school district got this program off and running and it has been a fantastic program. So I'm glad that we get to sit here and you can see all of the, the work that has gone into today. 
Um, so building on the found over the past month, the Basic Ed Funding Commission has received testimony across the state on the big picture of how we need to fully and fairly fund public schools. And building on that foundation today, we're gonna take a closer look at some of the specific components that teachers, students, advocates, and the court all agree are integral to a comprehensive, effective, and contemporary system of public education. Programs like career and tech ed, quality pre-K, special ed, and mental health supports, and more. We know that every single student in Pennsylvania can succeed if they have the right supports in place. These programs are a big part of that and make a real difference in the lives of everyone in the school building. I look forward to the, today's discussion on how we can better provide those necessary supports for our students and educators. And with that, I'd like to welcome you to my, I welcome you to my Senate district, but I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Walters to welcome us to his district, Pittsburgh Public Schools. Great, much better. Um, again, I am Dr. Wayne Walters, proud superintendent of the Pittsburgh Public Schools. And on behalf of our board of directors, who you've met earlier, one of our board members, Sylvia Wilson, is here. Uh, the students and staff of Pittsburgh Public Schools, I want to welcome the Basic Education Funding Commission and thank you for selecting our district to host today's hearing. Thank you to co-chairs, Senator Kristen Phillips-Hill, and Representative Mike Sterla for providing opportunities for multiple voices to be heard on a topic that is critical to ensuring positive outcomes and experiences for children across our Commonwealth. A special thank you to Senator Lindsey Williams of the 38th Senatorial District. You have continued to remain a champion of public education and we're grateful to you. I must also thank Principal Clausen and the entire Pittsburgh Westinghouse School family and community for opening doors to host today's hearing. The 20,000 students we serve from pre-K to 12th grade are the heart of everything we do. We strive to meet their unique needs in 54 schools, including one online academy and 20 magnet schools. We serve more than 1,000 children, representative of multiple nationalities and ethnicities who speak 95 different languages. And we provide them with intensive support in 12 schools that serve as English as a second language centers. And through these centers, we provide English language learners a safe place to learn and grow. Within 85 early childhood education classrooms, teachers who are certified in early childhood education ensure all young children thrive in a child-centered, developmentally appropriate environment. Today's hearing is taking place within our career and technical education programs, emergency response technology classroom, one of 16 career and technical education programs offered across our district, and one of the multiple career and technical education programs offered right here at Pittsburgh Westinghouse 6 through 12. Whether a student needs academic support or enrichment activities, individualized education, assistance with social emotional development, or gaining competency with a new language, we meet them where they are and work tirelessly to fulfill their hopes and dreams. Our district's motto is students first, always, in all ways. And this is more than a tagline for me, but what it is, is what we must truly do if we're going to reach our district mission to become one of America's premier school districts, student-focused, well-managed, and innovative. We welcome you and thank you for your active listening on this very important topic. And again, welcome to the Pittsburgh Public Schools. Thank you, Dr. Walters. <clears throat> I'll now call up our first panel. Uh, it is Angela Mike, Executive Director of CTE, Pittsburgh Public Schools, and Dr. Darby Copeland, President of Pennsylvania Association of Career and Technolo Technical Administrators and Executive Director of Parkway West. Will you please rise uh, first uh, and raise your right hand to be sworn in. Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you will give before the commission will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you. Uh, Angela, you can begin. All right, good morning, everyone. 
So as was mentioned, my name's Angela Mike, and I am the Executive Director of Career and Technical Education here at Pittsburgh Public Schools. And I've served in this capacity since 2010, but I've actually been with the district for 27 years. Um, so our goal in CT, let's talk about that first. Our goal is to empower our, our students in career and technical education to be successful and be able to transition into post-secondary education, and I emphasize and or post-secondary education. So students in CT do have the <coughs> best of both worlds and can do both. We also want them to be um, contributing members of society. CTE prepares our students for career pathways in the global marketplace by offering experiential learning, post-secondary credits, and also industry certifications. As Dr. Walters mentioned, we have 16 different career and technical education programs, but there are actually 21 programs. We have some duplicates in our regional, in our regional model, and we have programs in six of our high schools. Each of those programs is linked to a state-identified high-priority occupation. Fifteen of our programs, we use the three-year model, so students are in our programs three years, three periods a day, which is about two hours a day, five days a week, and for three years, as I said. Um, and we also, this year, have a little over 500 students in career and technical education, but we also provide um, exploratory elective courses for a little over 4,000 students in the district for exposure. So what can students gain through CTE? There are three main things. Stackable industry certifications that we mentioned. Yes, these are real industry recognized certifications. Transcripted dual enrollment credits. And preparation for high wage, high skills, in demand careers. So our CTE students receive a lot of hands-on training in our labs, like the one you're sitting in today, with state-of-the-art equipment. The equipment mirrors the real world as if they were at work. They're taught by teachers who are industry pro professionals in their respective fields, and our students learn how to use tools, techniques, software, yes, technologies in every CTE lab, and hardware necessary for the world of work. CTE also provides academic and career counseling supports along with career preparation resources to help them obtain the competence and confidence to successfully transition into their chosen career paths. So you're probably thinking, well, what are the outcomes? Here are some outcomes for you that our students earn. Increased graduation rates in career and technical education, career and college readiness, student motivation and engagement, academic and technical proficiency, critical thinking, which is really important to be ready for the world of work and or post-secondary, problem solving and communication skills, also known as 21st century skills, or some people now call them power skills. Access to entry level positions, and this is really important, career laddering jobs, so they can use those stackable industry certifications to move up and have upward mobility at where they choose to work. The work that we do and the impact of our programs would not be possible without the funding that we receive from our government, so thank you. At the federal level, we have received short-term funding from our ESSER grant, the Business Education Partnership grant, and of course our annual Perkins grant um, that is so important for us in career and technical education that keeps us running every year. At the state level, we annually receive subsidies for every student enrolled in the program starting in 10th grade and above, and we also received the Supplemental Equipment Grant. The state also recently reinstated um, the funding for dual enrollment, and we thank you and we appreciate that also because that also benefits all our kids in PPS, including the career and technical education students. We were really happy about that. We received the grant from the Governor's Emergency Education Relief Fund also, and we also got a two-year grant through the Pennsylvania Department of Labor, which has helped us across all of our CTE programs. So thank you again.
So how has the funding really helped our programs and our students? I'm going to go into a little bit more detail and talk about that federal funding that came down and how it helped. And then I'll talk about what through the state level. So let's talk about Perkins funding. What does it cover for us? It covers some salaries so that we can have career counselors for CT kids, An English and mathematics integration teacher, which really helps our students in career and technical education, and the teachers. Um, also, we have one cooperative education coordinator that the Perkins Funds helps us with, and we were finally able to reinstate that position after 11 years, so thank you again. Perkins funding is also used to pay for really important industry certifications. So those stackable industry certifications, the barriers removed for our students because we're paying for those certs um, when our students are in our programs. Also, student transportation so that they can go out on job exploration field trips, which is another key component of career and technical education. It also pays for equipment, technology for our labs, Plus, um, it provides additional uh, professional development to be had by our staff so that we can keep up to date, too, for the students and teachers, and our teachers can be up to date and current. I'll talk a little bit about ESSER funds. We use this, and we were really excited about this, to cover air conditioning costs in five of our programs. And our buildings are old. We don't have air conditioning most of them, most of them. So we really had to take a look at our six buildings with our programs and see where would best help us. And so that down the road, not only would we help our students during the day to be comfortable in their labs and be able to work, but we probably could do some things in the summer now. So thank you again. That air condition really meant a lot to the um, programs who got that. We love to you know, had that go across all of them, but we're grateful for what we got. Um, also, that funding helped us to get some lighting. So in some of our programs, the lighting um, needed to be updated, and we were able to do that. And then we also were able to purchase two tiny house kits. You probably saw one coming in, um, one here and one at Carrick High School for our carpentry programs. And that really helps to build capacity within our carpentry programs, and the work that we do with, the, with our Carpenters Union. So next is the Business Education Partnership Grant. We received that through Partner for Work, which is our local uh, workforce development board. That's our web. And they provided supplement, that provided supplemental support for a pilot program through Allegheny Health Network. And that allowed our health career students to get positions to become patient care technicians. And they were able to leave in their senior year and go to Allegheny Health Network at West Bend Hospital and also at Allegheny General Hospital and make $16.50 an hour in their senior year. So the skills that they learned in their program, they were able to put it into practice and make money, which is what CT is supposed to do for our students. So we saw it come to life in that program. Um, and a lot of the barriers for those students, again, were eliminated because of the funding through that grant helped us with transportation and additional certification costs to get them prepared to go to work. So at the state level, annual subsidies, we appreciate these also. They help to cover the cost that's not funded by other, th other funding that we talked about. And through subsidies, the funding that comes in, we're able to get more student um, uniforms, supplies, equipment, specialty furniture, um, and support students to be in a career and technical organization, which we are a part of Skills USA. Our supplemental equipment grant, I want to talk about that a little bit too. Through our occupational advisory committees, they recommend and they come and they look through our labs and they help us as industry partners. What do we need to have in, in our labs to make sure that we're current and up to date? The students are ready to go to work. And the suggestions that were made because we had that supplemental equipment grant, we were able to get some things for our um, program teachers, and I'll give you some examples. So our last allocation that we got, we used to purchase a downdraft table for our carpentry program right here at Westinghouse High School. We were also able to get a glue pool repair collision system for our auto body repair program at Brashear an ECG simulator, catheterization simulator, human skeleton, and a human torso model for our health careers programs, which is our largest program in the district um, at Carrick High School, Perry, and Westinghouse. We actually have four teachers um, in our, for our health careers programs across those three schools. Gear funding, so we have some photos just to give you an idea and hopefully we're able to share them. And I'll start to talk and hopefully something pops up on the 
screen. So we, um, we were able to get, everybody's familiar with this new virtual reality simulations, right? Everybody's into it. I even tried it with my kids, um, <laughs> different games and things. But here's how we're using it in the classroom. We purchased, through our gear funds, a Sim Spray powder training bay for our automotive body repair program. So this is a safe and cost-effective virtual reality training tool for painters and coders. It allows our students to learn to use a paint spray gun without expending consumable supplies in the process. The hands-on experience are emphasized while cleanup and the prep time are minimized. So, and our students love it. So this saves us a lot of money with the simulator, um, and it also allows them to do additional training without us losing those products that are extremely expensive. So thanks for that. Next, I'm going to move to the Survivor Immersive Virtual Reality Program, a platform. So that's used right here in this lab, and I'll tell you what it does. It's for situational police training. And um, it, what it does is it uses um, this system to allow them to be engaged with law enforcement component of their curriculum, and there'll be scenarios that they go through. And students actually feel like they're in the moment um, as a police officer on the street dealing with an issue that may come up. And if you come in and watch them, they're like lost in another world while they're doing this. And I tried it, and it makes you feel like you are really standing on a street corner. The one scenario I tried was um, someone was being disruptive in the neighborhood, and they had called the police. And so you learn how to de-escalate the situation. Um, a great tool to use in a classroom, and just so that you know, several law enforcement agencies are using this. That's how we found out. And it also, um, um, the US, the, they're contracted with the U.S. Air Force Security Forces also for realistic de-escalation. So it's, it's also a great tool to use. Again, thank you for grant funds to be able to get that for our students. We also were awarded two... Um, a two-year school-to-work grant through the Department of Labor, where our carpentry pre-apprenticeship program is able to use, again, to remove barriers. So the funding from there helps to cover costs for students to transition into the Carpenters Union from the pre-apprenticeship to the apprenticeship program. Um, you'd be surprised, but this grant is helping us in ways. I'm going to take it down to the basics. Students need work boots. It's that simple. The work boots now are like almost $200. When I started, they were about $100, $150. Now they're almost $200. Our students, if they're just starting right out of high school to transition, they need support with that. That was a barrier. This grant and this funding removed it. So we're able to take the kids at the end of the school year on a school bus, get their shoe boots tried on, pick a pair of boots, um, and also get a toolkit. They can go into the union and have all the things they need. And of course, um, they're able to get their certifications. And the cost to get into the union is covered through this grant. So we removed the barriers there, again, because of the funding that was provided through the Department of Labor through this grant. Now, um, hopefully, it pops up again on the screen. But I want to allow you to see some faces um, and give you some, a few examples of the impact of funding has had on our students. So you're looking at Anaya Givner. She's a CT cosmetology graduate from Perry High School. And she passed her cosmetologist license before she graduated. Right out of high school, she became an entrepreneur. She owns 1K Style Salon. She's also an online content creator. And the retraining that she received in our career and tech program, because we had all the latest of everything, she was able to save $30,000 that she would have spent on school. And not only did she save money, but she saved time. She started her business, and I thought it was important to see that brand new car she just got. Wow, right out of high school. So those are one of our success stories. Um, I'll give you another story. Medina. There's Medina in the middle. So she's a 2023 graduate from our Health Careers Technology Program. And here's where I talked about the best of both worlds, where CT students can go to work and or go to school. She's doing both. So not only did she complete the Allegheny Health Network Program that I talked about in her senior year and worked um, at the hospital, um, but she also got accepted into a nursing program at Carla. 
So Medina decided I'm going to keep my job because I need the funds at the hospital, but then I'm also going to go to Car Carlo College, and she's doing both. And it was the funding through the grant that helped us get her to the point where she could have options like that and be prepared and feel comfortable with going to Carlo while she still has some funding coming in. The other um, beautiful thing about this is that because she's at Allegheny Health Network, there is tuition reimbursement that's also going to help her along. So again, saving time, money, um, keeping our kids out of debt. Another success story. I'll move on. Ibrahim. Ibrahim is next. Ibrahim transitioned from the pre-apprenticeship program to the apprenticeship program at the Carpenters Union. In fact, all those students um, entered into the Carpenters Union last year when they graduated. Um, Ibrahim really is inspirational because he worked past language barriers um, that he had um, in the classroom. Him, him and his family are from Rwanda. And the teacher worked really well with him. And again, I'm going to take it back to the funding. Because of the Schools to Work grant, we were able to cover all those costs to get into the apprenticeship program. Um, and he made a smooth transition. He got his boots, his toolkit, and he's doing wonderful on the site working. So that's another success story, and then I'll give you one more. Keyshawn Brooks, he graduated from here at Westinghouse High School, and let me tell you about Keyshawn. He was in our business program. He now went on to, he went on to Teal College. He now works for REACH. He came back in the district, and he's working um, with a, to prevent violent incidents in Pittsburgh Public Schools. He also works directly with community engagement officers to provide meaning, meaningful support to high school students that have been impacted by violence and threats of danger. And he uses the skills that he learned in his business program to help him in his job. So another success story um, there. So as I'm sure you all know, there's thousands of success stories. These are a few from Pittsburgh, but across the state, um, the CT directors can speak to many more success stories that CT students have had. But there are challenges in continuing to provide quality programs that will yield the kind of results that we just saw from the students. And we know that there are needs and that there are economy demands that we have to think about. So let's think about expenses. This is one area where we could use some help. Large equipment. One piece of equipment could cost up to $30,000. So equipment is very expensive. Transportation. Buses have tripled in the last three years. It's unbelievable how much it costs to get a bus to take students on a, the work-based learning field trips. Also, industry certification vouchers have went up. They've increased, and then costs to cover the technology and software that we use um, in our programs also has increased. We are doing as much as what we have, but we could use more support to help the students to be career ready and make sure that we have enough to fund those areas. Here are a couple other ways that we could think about um, possibly um, helping around funding. Flexibility. So. We have a state-sponsored equipment grant that comes out. Currently, we have um, a supplemental equipment grant, but then we also have a competitive equipment, equipment grant. And here, it's, it's not a problem. It's just maybe something that we could do possibly a little better to help everyone. If those two pots of funding, and we just recently had this conversation at um, our PACTA Association meeting, here's, here's a concern. CTEs and CTCs have limited staff and it's hard to get someone to write those grants. The one grant, you apply for it and you get the funding. The competitive grant, you have to have a match, and every CTC doesn't have someone to match those funds. The ask is, is it possible to combine those funds and we distribute those as for need? And then that would eliminate some of the barriers for our directors and um, not having the capacity to either get the match or to write the grant, which takes a lot of time. It also happens at the beginning of the year when folks are, are extremely busy and it's kind of hard to get folks to have time to sit down and write those grants right at the beginning of the year. It's a really quick turnaround. So that's one thing. Um, second, flexibility in state funds allocated for career and technical education. Currently, there's funding that comes in to maintain our programs that we have now. 
but there's really no funding for startups. So while things are changing um, and there's a demand for different areas, we also appreciate that there were several new programs added. One of the programs was aviation and aeronautics was recently added. That would be a great exciting program for students, but costs are prohibitive and there's no startup costs. We get costs to maintain and keep the programs that we have. There's also a new SIP code for an education program. We're all aware of that and we're excited about it because there's a nationwide shortage and we also have that pro pro problem here at Pittsburgh Public Schools. However, you still need startup costs to start that program. So please consider these suggestions around career and tech technical education funding so that we can continue to provide quality CTE programs. Thank you for the opportunity for me to present today and your continued support of career and technical education. I'd like to leave us with um, a CBS Mornings. They did a recent, well, they recently highlighted Pittsburgh Public Schools career and technical education. And if I could just leave you with that clip today, um, I would love to if you could just watch this. I think it kind of sums everything up. Thank you all again. If not, maybe we can get it and play it a little later. Okay. okay. Uh, Dr. Copeland. Good morning. Uh, my name is Darby Copeland. I'm the president of the Pennsylvania Association of Career and Technical Administrators and the proud executive director of Parkway West Career and Technology Center located here in Allegheny County. Parkway West is the largest career center in Allegheny. We have in excess of 1,300 students uh, from 12 member school districts and nine uh, non-member school districts, so a total of 21. Very busy place. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to be here today to discuss basic education funding formula and how it can impact career and technical education, not only in Allegheny County, but across Pennsylvania. My testimony today will focus on the access and success of career and technical education for all students. Everyone agrees that our nation's education is essential to the quality of its workforce, and career and technical education is essential to the development of a workforce. Career technical education is imperative to workforce development, and workforce development is essential to economic development, which is vital to achieving a higher standard of living a robust economy results in a higher tax base, which in turn provides greater resources. The continuum and link between education and the economy is indisputable. A little, little bit better, sorry about that. CTE is, is really transformed um, over the years from an elective program that perhaps many of us participated in high school to a career major and, and really part of every student's career path to a high skill, high wage, family sustaining occupation. Most CTCs in, in Pennsylvania, unfortunately, lack the minimum funding required to enhance existing programs and are unable to open new programs necessary to support regional workforce needs. Many CTCs like mine, Parkway West, are more than 50 years old and have had little renovation and may have obsolete and many have obsolete instructional equipment. This needs to the need to provide state of the art facilities, equipment and program is the most critical issues facing career and technical education in Pennsylvania schools. For example, at my school, we are currently doing a feasibility study for a possible renovation and or expansion in the future. And it's due to our 127% increase in enrollment over the last 12 years. So more than double the size of the school in 12 years. The, however, the renovation, once a study is completed, has to be considered by 12 school boards and 108 school board members 
who are having financial shortfalls in their own district. It's not that they don't want to help CTE. They can't make ends meet in their own school districts. So it's a very tough position to put them in. And it really comes down to a fork in the road. We either expand and renovate and offer CTE to all children, which is their legal right, or we limit enrollment. And when, we talk, when I talk to schools across the state and my role as the PACTA president, there are way more career centers in Pennsylvania that are turning children away than aren't because programs are at capacity, because funding is not available at a facility level or a staffing level. It, it's, it's getting very close um, to, to being an educational crisis for us right here in Pennsylvania. Career and technical education schools in Pennsylvania are essentially funded from three sources, and those sources are federal, state, and local. So from a federal side, we receive Carl D. Perkins funding, and that represents, it varies from school to school, but it's about 3% of the average CTE's funding. So those funds are more often than not utilized to assist with special education needs. School districts, as you know, receive IDEA funding for special education students. However, that funding does not follow the students to the career center. So the career centers must build in, use their Perkins money and or build in money from their local budget, which drives the local share cost up, to try to, to support the special education students. In my school, we have a 39% special education rate. So if you do the math on that, that that's some big numbers. And when this, when this happens, you have to use a disproportionate amount of your Perkins federal money uh, to support special education. Therefore, you can't purchase new and updated equipment and, and do those types of things that you really need to maintain um, what the kids are, are, are going to go out into the workforce, right? We want, we, we want them to be prepared to see the types of things they're going to once they go in and to be work ready. The second is state subsidy, and that subsidy has increased every year for the last several years, and we, sh we sure do appreciate that. It has really, really helped. Uh, in the average career center, that's about 8%. So if you're following along with me, um, the local share is 89 to 90% um, funded by the home school districts. So, and, and that, when you factor in demographic uh, indicators, decreasing federal funds, less, less subsidy for school districts. Um, the portion uh, of the CTC budget is often more than 90% uh, that's shared on the backs of the home school districts. Uh, ultimately, uh, most school districts support CTE uh, by and large. But again, there's, it's a pie, right? There's so much money in that pie, and, and, and if they have to pay their own bills, and they have to also try to take care of the career center, um, it's a very very difficult decision that we put uh, school board members in to try to fund the CTE. The current method of funding uh, was determined in the mid-1960s by the Pennsylvania Department of Education, and it was sent out uh, through guidelines uh, when jointures began. So Career and Technical Education America started with the Smith-Hughes Act, um, and in the 60s, the majority of the school, 60s and early 70s, the majority of the area career centers were built in Pennsylvania. Um, school districts were formed jointures. In my case, there's 12 school, member school districts that own Parkway West. Um, and, and they basically laid out two big areas for cost centers. Capital cost, which are funded by the member school district based upon their tax uh, assessed values. And annual operating costs, which are determined by average daily membership, meaning how many students come from each school district uh, that determines what the districts pay on that, on that proportion. So what that basically created is, is a pay-for-use concept. Every student has a dollar sign attached to, to themselves when they come to the career center. And, and that's really uh, led to a devastating impact on career and technical education and, and beyond that to the workforce. I would challenge anybody to go to any company today and, and the one common thing you're going to hear is what? We need workers. We need skilled, qualified workers. And if we don't get skilled, qualified workers, we're going to leave Pennsylvania and take our tax money with us. And I see a lot of head shaking across from me because you folks are getting beat up on that, I'm sure, on a daily basis. Um, and it really starts with, with career and technical education and preparing children to go out in those entry-level jobs. 
Another unintended consequence of the funding method is, is again, um, employers' ability to not be able to find highly skilled, ready-to-work individuals. And, you know, if you have the unfortunate uh, uh, situation where your car gets wrecked and you go to a local body shop, it's a long time to get your car fixed. Do you know why it's a long time? Because they don't have a qualified workers to do that. My goodness, if you have a plumbing issue in your house and you're able to find a plumber to come and work for you, you have to pay whatever they ask because there's not another person to come. And, and these stories can go on and on, but I think you get, get my drift uh, with, with where we're at. CTCs are not tuition schools. CTCs do not make money. Uh, we, we, our budgets are based solely on the cost of providing high quality career technical education programs coupled with traditional fixed costs, right? Teachers need to be paid, teachers need to have benefits, those types of fixed things. We have an electric bill, we have a gas bill, just, just like you would have at home, obviously. Um, but when these schools were built, um, particularly the regional centers like mine, they were also built as cost-saving mechanisms, right? A consortium approach. So in my situation, instead of 12 school districts having 12 auto body programs and 12 welding programs and 12 public safety programs, there's one. It it's truly is a cost-saving mechanism. A and that itself um, allows us to offer many more programs uh, to children. When students have unrestricted access to career and technical education, the enrollment increases and the cost per student decreases. So on a very simple, simple level, if the budget's $1,000 and 1,000 students attend, it's a dollar per student. If the budget's $1,000 and 500 students, the cost per student is $1.50 a student. So the cost goes down per student. From a facility standpoint, um, it's a really big struggle for us. Technology has changed everything. Uh, I would submit that if you have a newer automobile outside and you open hood, it'd be a challenge to find where to check the oil. Everything is a computer in today's times. Um, and, and that has been a challenge for career centers because, again, we have to have our, our children ready to go out to be entry level work ready. They have to see the same types of equipment, the same types of machines, the same types of automobiles in our programs that they would see out in the quote unquote real world. So this presents a huge financial challenge. Um, it's very, very costly to set up the instructional spaces. Um, and, and even beyond that, it's very, very expensive to expand instructional spaces. And that is something that we're going through right now. There are more if you go across my 16 programs, every student who graduates and wants to go to work has many opportunities. There are way more jobs than there are qualified students. And again, many career centers across Pennsylvania are turning students away on a daily basis that really want to be a welder, that really want to be an electrician, that really want to be a nurse, that really want to be a cosmetologist but they don't have the square footage and the space to be able to do that. For our districts that fund our schools, uh, and I'm very blessed with the districts that attend Parkway West, they've always had Parkway a, a priority, and um, that has been uh, a very blessing. It's very clear to see that with how well our students do. The Act 1 index does not apply to CTCs, but every member school district is governed by the base index, which is driven by the state average. Therefore, it's difficult for career centers to go above the index. Um, just next year in my jointure, um, I'm asking to go above the index, and it's been a very, very difficult ask for me. And it's not that my districts don't want to support us, but when you start adding staff to service more children, and you start buying more welders, and you start buying more lumber, and you start buying more electrical wire, those costs skyrocket very quickly. Um, I think we can all agree that we're all spending way more at the grocery store today than we were two years ago. With 110 children cooking, I'm sure you can imagine that my costs are uh, quite a bit higher. Um, with you know, Act 1, 
uh, obviously there's unintended consequences of, of many things, and Act 1 is, is one of those. It really limits the CTC's ability to modernize their facility and to add new programs. Um, the cost of adding one new CTE program will absolutely exceed the Act 1 index on any given year. And Ms. Mike spoke to some of that in her testimony as well. Um, we're often limited with granting only to improve existing programs. Uh, one program that, that I would love to open is heavy equipment operator in this area. There are no secondary programs in this area. There's a critical shortage. And talk about a family sustaining wage plus. But the amount of money it would take for us to open that is, is just not doable. It's just not. Um, the PA legislature and the Department of Education has provided supplemental and uh, competitive equipment grants, and this funding has made a huge difference in every CTC across our Commonwealth. However, the amount available is far less than the amount needed for modernizing several programs. For example, in an auto body program, a paint booth far exceeds $100,000. The maximum on a matching funding is $50,000. But as Mrs. Mike alluded to, you have to have that $50,000 match. And in southwest Pennsylvania, there are a lot of small schools, small schools which has one or two administrators. And it's a bandwidth issue of being able to, to write the grants, to be able to find the matches. Um, I, I echo her ask to you that that money all be moved into the supplemental line item, which is much easier to utilize and will affect every kid in CTE across Pennsylvania, not only children who go to schools that have the staff to write grants. So I, I, I can't echo that uh, enough. Uh, for many CTCs across the state, the competitive and the supplemental grant are the only avenues to get additional equipment because their budgets are, are just stretched so very far. From an access perspective, um, Despite the fact that CTE is a right for every child in Pennsylvania, if a child wants CTE, they have to be given it. Um, despite that right, school districts determine who come to a career and technical center. And the process of selecting students is very different across virtually every school district in Pennsylvania. But one constant is the district does ultimately make the decision on who comes to the career centers. Now, if a student is denied that, and I do get a call or two of that every year when a parent calls. Of course, the districts allow those children to go. But sometimes the reason children don't come isn't necessarily the fault of the school district. It, it's the fault of, of not having funding to have career counselors, something else that you heard earlier today, the ability to really talk to kids about uh, what they want to do with their life. You know, as we look at, at colleges, and I'm, I'm sure you folks have heard the statistics, you know, how, what percentage of kids, the last statistics I saw in Pennsylvania were that 56% of kids who go off to a four-year college graduate in six years. So first question is, where are the rest of them? Is anybody looking for them? And the second question becomes, why does it take six years? We see a lot of churn in a career center. If a student comes and says, I really want to be a welder, we let them try welding. And if that doesn't work out, and they say, maybe, maybe nursing's the thing for me, we'll let you try nursing. And if that doesn't work, maybe they want to be a auto mechanic. And by goodness, when they get to that program that, that, where that synergy happens, where that passion is and they want to do it, every thing in their life gets better. Their school attendance gets better. Their grades gets better. Oftentimes, for kids from low socioeconomic districts, they're, they're, they're able to bring money in to, to help them survive and their families survive. So it's OK for kids to figure out what they like and what they don't like, what they're good at and what, they don't, what they're not good at. That, that gets them out there much quicker and much faster. The one thing, and I would challenge every one of you to reach out to your career center directors in your state and check my facts on this. The one thing that I guarantee you each and every one of them would tell you is that they've had people recently and regularly during their career tell them 
and I'm talking about employers, students, parents, CTE is the best kept secret. We didn't know what this place was. We thought it was a place where those kids go. We hear this regularly. Um, and, and when you think about that, it's kind of disheartening. You know, uh, if a child really has a dream to be a nurse, a pharmacist, a physician, fill in the blank, if they could have some exposure to that at the secondary level and really see what that means, right? Um, I think all of us have perceptions of what every job is, but we really don't understand what every job is. You know, there are some people I'm sure who think it's pretty easy to be a legislator, but I bet there's some people in the room saying that's just not the case now, is it? Right? You get beat up six ways from Sunday every day. So to really get that option to really understand what it is and really authentically say this is where I want this is my passion this is where I want to spend the rest of my life uh, student access has been it has been restricted for a number of years there's no question um, if it wasn't we wouldn't CTC directors across the street wouldn't receive these phone calls from folks saying hey uh, my child really wants to do CTA and we were told no and what happens in some places is those numbers, those dollar signs get put on a student's head and we can only afford to send X number of students to the Career Center. Just in recent memory in my own jointure, uh, a school district tried to eliminate an entire grade level of children from coming to the Career Center to balance a budget. That did not happen in the long run, but that was the third time that that was attempted by that school district. Um, what a disservice to children. What a disservice to the regional workforce. Uh, and, and we're very thankful that we were able to, to get ahead of that and get that fixed to where we need to be. So I, much like Mrs. Mike, will leave you with a few recommendations that I hope you'll, you'll think about as we wrap up my portion of the testimony this morning. The quality of CTE and its ability to support PA's workforce and economic development has been compromised because of the deterioration of federal and state fundings for CTE. The cost of career and technical education, no question, costs more than basic education. You can just look around any career education lab, including this one. You'll see fire coats, firefighter outfits, where one cost over $1,000 before breathing operation. You see police cars, you see fire trucks, you see things of that nature. It is, it is expensive. And much of this is, is bared on the back of school districts that are already struggling themselves. Maintaining the stable base for basic education subsidy would result in higher CTE access and a greater number of CTE graduates would be available to sustain economic growth in Pennsylvania. Economic growth results in higher standards of living, which produces a greater tax base for the state as well as for local school districts. At the end of the day, we all want our children to be contributing members of society. We want them to come back into our communities to raise families uh, and, and help the next generation. And CTE just, does just that. And it's very rude, it's very core, that, that's what it does. CTE is very well recognized by business and industry as a vital component of the workforce and economic development. The employers that represent our 16 trade areas and our 16 career majors, um, they're at our doorstep almost daily looking for students. Uh, much like legislators who get beat up because there's not a workforce, so do I. So I feel your pain on that one. Um, so in closing, we would recommend that the PA legislative supplemental funding for CTE equipment be appropriated at the same level or higher and that that competitive grant be pushed into the supplemental. That the PA legislator provide additional funding to support modernization and or development of new CTE programs. There's a lot changing in our region and in our state, and it's very difficult, again, for career centers because, remember, to open one program, that exceeds the Act 1 index in most situations. Funding uh, be established to increase the availability of career counseling and information for all PA students uh, in, in each school district in Pennsylvania. And funding to uh, be established to support the renovation and expansion of career and technology education centers. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for the opportunity to testify this morning. I'll be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. We're going to lead off with uh, Representative Ortitai. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you both for, for being here today and the, and the work that you do. Um, I, I know through both of your testimonies, you had touched a little bit on some of your partnerships that you have. And I was wondering, 
if you could expand a little bit more on some of the private private partnerships that you have where maybe you have businesses investing directly in your programs, working with you on certifications, perhaps even providing equipment, uh, maybe in facilities and other resources. Uh, and also maybe some of the partnerships you have with some of our local trade unions in the area. I, I know, Ms. Mike, you brought up the Carpenters Union. Great program, great apprenticeship program. The operating engineers, uh, Dr. Copeland, when you were talking about uh, heavy equipment, that, that was the first thought that popped in my mind. I know that they're looking for people like crazy now, but I was wondering if both of you could talk about that. Sure, um, we have a lot of folks in the city of Pittsburgh who are supporting us. I'll give you a couple examples. Um, I'll start with our mayor, Mayor Ganey, the city of Pittsburgh. So we have a partnership with them. Um, we actually started that partnership under Mayor Perduto um, when Senator Williams mentioned starting this program that you're in right now. So that's where the partnership began, and I'm going to tell you how it grew. So under Mayor Perduto, he uh, donated what you see here in this lab, the police car, the fire engine, and the ambulance that's behind me. But not only did um, he do that, they also continued to work with us and our students and um, provide the folks to be a part of our occupational advisory, do in-class demonstrations, and for our students to go on site to do ride-alongs and work with them. Um, that partnership expanded when Mayor Ganey came, and now we have our partnership, and it has a name. It's under his plan for Prepare to Prosper, um, and it's, it's, I think, Pathways to Prosperity, and our little piece of that plan is Prepare to Prosper. So under that plan, this is really exciting because the mayor said any student that comes out of a career in tech program, we match our CT programs to his department and saw where the connection was. Those students can have a job in those departments. We work with their HR department. They are rewriting some of those job descriptions to fit entry level, and our students can go into those jobs. So that's one piece. Last year and over the summer, they did paid internships with the city of Pittsburgh. But the second piece to that um, in his transition plan, he even went even deeper. He said, any kid that comes out, if I don't have a job at the city, then I'll get other partners to come on board and make sure they get a job. So guaranteed jobs for every student. So that partnership's going great. Their um, EMT um, director um, or chief um, works with our program here, and they also send one of their instructors in to co-teach with our teacher to make sure that transition into the city is good. Another partnership, the STEAM Fitters. I have to talk about the STEAM Fitters for a minute. They came in. Um, Ken Broad, I'm going to say the name. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely phenomenal. He came himself and did a tour of our lab, walked through the lab, talked to the students, and pointed out right away, you could use this, you could use that. The next thing I knew, $30,000 or over $30,000 of equipment showed up at the HVAC lab at Autodice High School. That's a partnership. That's someone who cares, really stepped up, just like the mayor's office, and said, we're here for the kids. We need them. It's a supply and demand issue. It's a win-win for all of us. Let's be partners. The other thing that I love, I love the new model with the pre-apprenticeship. So while we have partnerships with folks, that, that a model to do a pre-apprenticeship puts everything into a formal. You can do an MOU, which is great. But the pre-apprenticeship makes you sit down with the partner and write out what are you going to do in your curriculum that matches to what we need when they leave. So now the partnership on both ends, you're contributing to what's going to happen in the classroom and outside. Another great partnership um, with the union, as you mentioned, the pre-apprenticeship, which folds right into the apprenticeship program. Give another shout out to Allegheny Health Network, UPMC, who has come on board too. And yes, they're, they're donating equipment that you asked about, long story short. And they are also supporting with out of school experiences and coming in the classroom and actually working with the students. So those are some examples. So I'll give you a few examples from a Parkway West standpoint. We do have a wonderful relationship with, with all the unions, all 16 trade unions. Um, they, they work collaboratively with us. Uh, and, and we send students each and every year. We also send students to the non-union side of the house as well. So. Uh, we, our goal is to prepare all the students for all the opportunities, and then they can decide what best fits them and where they want to go. But I do have two um, particular partnerships I'd like to share with you, one that's established and one that's in the process of being established that I'm very excited about. 
Uh, the established one, uh, Parkway West Current Technology Center became the 17th secondary school in the country and the only in Pennsylvania to be a registered pre-apprenticeship program with Cummins Diesel. So students in our diesel program, um, by the time they reach the 11th grade, they can be on a cooperative education experience where they're part of the time in school and part of the time working alongside a master technician at Cummins Diesel right here in Pittsburgh. Uh, upon their graduation, they get automatic placement, advanced standing in that apprentice program. So you do some quick and dirty math. By the time they're about 21 years old, they're graduated. Um, we hope that they stay in the Pittsburgh region and live. But if that's not their plans or not their goals, they can be moved anywhere in the country where there's a Cummins location and be 21, 22 years old, making excess of, of six figures. So it's a really good deal. The day after we signed that agreement, we had about $100,000 worth of engines delivered to our school at no cost. And Cummins continues to support our program and our teachers. It's a wonderful opportunity for kids. It's, it's been a fantastic uh, opportunity to really start a new program and minimize those costs to a school district because starting a diesel program is very very expensive uh, another program that is uh, in its infancy and and should be starting hopefully soon um, the bricklayers and allied craft workers local uh, uh, nine right here in Pittsburgh approached me about two years ago uh, wanting to know what it would take to start a bricklaying program and as we had our conversations, I said, I'd love to have a bricklaying program, but as I shared with, with this board earlier, I don't have any space. Well, what's it gonna take, Dr. Copeland? I said, well, I need a building. They said, no problem, we'll build you a building. And I thought, <laughs> yeah, okay, that's really gonna happen, right? So I left the meeting and, and, and uh, I gotta tell you, we have an MOU with our board of directors. Uh, it's about a $1.3 million facility. Two thirds of the funding is secured. Uh, if anybody has uh, any funding ideas, you want to be part of something special, <laughs> call me. Uh, but we're hopeful that that's going to be secured during this year. And that will be opening another new program, another 17th career major for our students at virtually zero cost to our students. So we, we are happy to partner with everybody and anybody out there. And I really give props to the bricklayers and allied craft workers because they're being part of the solution. And we hope that this will be a model that other union trades will really take a look at. And I would have to, I'd be remiss if I didn't uh, thank Senator Robinson who helped uh, secure some funding for that. Thank you. Sounds like a great opportunity for somebody to come up with an RCAP. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, Representative Schwire. Good morning and thank you. Um, first and foremost, uh, Ms. Mike, I, I, you were beaming when you're students in honor, but you held absolutely not a close candle to Ms. Wilson behind you, who was, the, the smile on that woman's face lit up this entire room. You wouldn't need new lighting with that. That was, it was, it was great to see. Uh, and, and just now, I, I appreciate not only your pride in the work that you're doing, but more importantly, pride in your student success. So kudos to both of you. Um, as we go through these hearings, uh, and as you heard, I think this is our seventh hearing, um, there's been a number of, I, 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 in my chicken scratch notes here, um, a, a couple of sort of random things. Uh, Mr. Copeland, you talked about facility needs routinely. Just a reminder to all my friends in the Senate that when we passed our facilities plan uh, earlier in the year, we included a specific carve out for the first time ever for CTE building construction and renovations. Um, not the equipment needs that you need, but the physical infrastructure it takes to house them. So uh, that, that's not lost on, on us as something that we absolutely need. I appreciate the conversations about facilities. One, um, one question that I sort of have, we have two very different models of CTE sitting in front of us. A school district a specific one and a regional one. I come from Allentown, uh, along with Senator Miller, our region has the regional Lee uh, Career and Technical Institute that even our large school district participates in. Um, from your perspectives, what are the positives and negatives of the individual school district model versus the regional one? You touched on it a little bit, but I kind of want to uh, drill down on that a little bit. So I, I, again, I think the regional schools really were developed from a cost saving mechanism. Uh, the, the difficulties with that is the transportation time and the amount of time that students leave during the course of a school day. But if you look at my 12 school districts, they would pay astronomically more to embed career and technical education within their, their home school districts. The city of Pittsburgh being a very large district uh, um, serving 
thousands and thousands of children, perhaps it makes sense to have, have it here. But I think for regional centers, for a school district to pull out of the regional center and start their own, I don't know that anybody could possibly afford that. I think that when you have a regional center, you also have the opportunity to have more offerings because everybody's sharing in that cost. Do you have anything you want to add, Angela? No, I think you did a good job of covering it. Well, I'm going to ask it this way then. Ms. Mike, do you have a little bit more flexibility with, with the, the direct relationship with the school district? Is it easier for you to at least advocate for your specific needs and your specific programs as opposed to a regional one? And, and uh, Dr. Copeland, I will say, don't speak about you. Speak about the statewide stuff so I, we, we save you sure. the, any, any sort of I individual uh, challenges you have. Is there, is there an ease to it? Is it more streamlined or is just the overall lack of, of, uh, of pulling resources sort of a hindrance? Um, I think there might be a little bit more of an ease for me um, because I'm dealing with one entity right. where you're dealing with 12. Yes. I'm dealing with, you know, one set of folks on everything CTE in the district. The other thing that makes um, our model a little different with having the programs in the comprehensive high schools is that Pittsburgh folks, and I'll say this, and Ms. Wilson's behind me, but I, I think that we have a thing where my grandfather graduated from Carrick, I graduated from Carrick, you know, so kind of being at their home school and being able to take their CT program also goes with, I think, a Pittsburgh feel that we kind of love carrying generations through schools. Um, I'll say it for myself, my family, seven of us, we feel that way. <laughs> Our alma mater and, you know, being a part of the community. The other thing, is that students can take a program right within their building. It doesn't separate them and put them on a bus to go somewhere else. So it takes some of the stigmatism away around, uh, from around the kids are going over there, but it's right in the building and it cuts down on the kids who stay in their buildings for a program. It cuts down on losing um, instructional time because the program's right within their building. So those are some of the benefits, but I think there's benefits on one end and the other end, it kind of weighs out. But for me, it's a little bit of an ease because so, I'm dealing with one entity. So just to echo what Mrs. Mike just said, um, that is the challenge when you have so many moving parts. And, and I appreciate the notion to protect me and speak more on a statewide level, but I've been, again, very, <laughs> been very, been very, uh, very blessed with the, the school districts and the superintendents that I work with. But just to give you a little, and I will use my jointure as an example because it's an easy example for me. I have 12 sending school districts. I'm in my 12th year as the executive director at Parkway West. One of those school districts has had the same superintendent that whole time. One other school district had the same superintendent who just retired. So I'll take those two out of the mix. In the last 12 years in the 10 school districts, I've been through 39 superintendents. And when a superintendent comes, uh, uh, they bring their vision to the district. That's what they're hired for. Um, it, it's, it's a lot of moving parts. My budget has to be passed by 108 school board members from 12 school districts socioeconomically from here to here. It, it's a, it, it's a, and it's a, and I think I'm getting right at what you're saying, and and that's true in every career center across the way. Now my colleagues that are in small jointures that have three or four school, four school districts tell me I'm blessed because in three or four school districts everybody's paying a big chunk. So there's 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 two different sides to that coin, but there are different challenges. I appreciate that. Uh, again, we're just looking at, at how we're spending the money and how much more we need to invest. So I appreciate those questions. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Uh, Chair Phillips -Hill. Thank you, Chairman Sterla. Ms. Mike, Dr. Copeland, it is a great time to be in career and technical education. Yes. Um, I think in all things education, the pendulum swings and we are definitely at a point where we know how valuable it is. And I'm blessed at home. We are all parochial, um, but I have an incredible um, school of technology in my district, the York County School of Technology. I have some amazing and innovative local programs as well. So let's turn to funding. Uh, the budget that was passed by the Senate included an additional $14 million for our area career and technical schools to be distributed through that career and technical education subsidy. Uh, the legislation that was passed by the House of Representatives, I think it was last week, had an increase of $7 million for area career 
and technical schools. That remaining seven million uh, of that 14 million would then be used to increase the amount of discretionary PA SMART grants that are awarded by the Department of Education for K-12 STEM initiatives. So my question to you is, were, were you surprised to see that increased funding for area career and technical schools being redirected to increase those PA SMART grants? And give me a sense. Um, are career and technical schools across the Commonwealth able to benefit from those PA uh, SMART grants? Um, we are, again, I think it goes back to who's going to write the grant, um, where's the time, capacity-wise. Um, we have really small teams. Um, so that's one thing I think about. The other thing is um, because those are opened up, and correct me if I'm incorrect, but K through 12, right, mm -hmm. and they're under STEM, um, just to be very transparent, there are a lot of folks who haven't put the two together, that career and technical education and STEM and STEAM all are under one umbrella. And I think we have to also work on or talk about what that looks like. So when you have STEM and STEAM, those are all great exploratory ways to get students exposed. But then I say CT is like STEM and STEAM on steroids, right? Because you're in there three years, three periods a day, um, five days a week. Very different from what happens in an exploratory course that you might may take a semester or a year. So I think kind of pushing that funding that way, it doesn't help us as much as it could. Because you're, unless you are working together and everybody understands STEM and STEAM should be a segue to feed into career and tech if those students are interested after they explore. And I think kind of making that pathway clear would help us in the long run. Um, but I was surprised to see the, that amount of funding going to those grants that would support more exploratory then would help CT programs when we're trying to, as we mentioned earlier, open new programs, keep up with equipment. So that's my thought. Generate workers it generate in high work. demand industries. And I can tell yes. you that back home in York County, they can't graduate enough fast enough to meet the demands of the employers in the district. I, thank you. Thank you. Dr. Copeland, you, you testified about the challenges, as did Ms. Mike, with startup costs to get these new programs up and running. You talked about the need for career counselors. Um, would you prefer that that additional money be directed toward uh, grants for those area career and technical schools rather than the PA SMART grants? Although PA SMART grant I think was intended to be a career center based grant, it has in reality very much become a K-12 grant for school districts. Um, I don't know the number of career centers that have applied for that, um, but I can tell you the number who have received that isn't really high. Um, and I think that, you know, sometimes our best intended things turn out to be a little different than what we started with. Um, so I think that that money coming back to career centers, but again, being mindful of the granting process. If the process is so huge and onerous, small schools don't have a shot. Oftentimes, small schools are the ones that need the most help. I'm intimately familiar with your, your uh, career center, and Dr. Rogers runs a fine school. I just visited it about a year ago. Um, but when you look at your school, it's very large. Um, he certainly doesn't have the amount of staff he needs, uh, but he has more than a lot of schools. So it becomes that challenging piece of, man, we really like to have a piece of that pie, but do we write the grant or do we take care of the kids or do we take care of the existing programs and the issues that we have? Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Williams. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you both for your testimony. I, I really enjoyed it. Um, so past testifiers have noted that even with additional resources, some schools would be challenged to hire new educators quickly, um, given disinvestment in higher ed and edu current educator shortages. Can both of you, either of you, shed some light on the challenges specific to the career and tech ed educator pipeline and how we might remove some of those barriers and help with with that so teacher certification is something that I'm very passionate about 
uh, and I hate to have to tell you this, but just here in Allegheny County, not at my school, uh, a diesel program co closed the school with 60 children because they could not find a teacher who was willing to, A, take a significant pay cut, B, have to go through an 11-year process to get fully certified as a CTE educator. And that's exactly what it takes, 11 years. I think that any CTE administrator will tell you, we feel that our teachers need some additional training, training around special education, training around the things that they don't know. But what our teachers don't get is credit for the subject matter expertise that they have. If you're gonna become an IE, IBEW union electrician, you spend five years of schooling. Three more, you could be a doctor, right? Um, but none of that training really transposes over into the training that they have to take. And currently that's 60 credits. And it is a legislative priority for the Pennsylvania Association of Career and Technical Educators to work with, in collaboration with uh, our legislative uh, partners to really bring forth some legislation to make some changes. So I, I do wanna take just a minute, if I may, Senator, to explain to you the onerous teacher certification process. If a teacher is hired, let's take a, a, an automotive. I think everybody relates to automotive. It's an easy tell because we all have cars, right? So an individual becomes an ASE master mechanic who is certified to the highest level by, by the industry, has to first come in and pay four to $500 to take a, uh, what we call an OCA, an occupational competency assessment. This assessment has a written component and it has a psychomotor component, which is 100% subjective to whoever's giving that because it's a different person at each and every school. Now, we mentioned networking earlier in the IT industry in a boom. I had a teacher who was a Cisco guru, if you will, the master Cisco person who could work for any company in this Commonwealth, make way more money than he could teaching kids, but he really had a passion about giving back. He was to the end of his career. He took his competency and he failed it with a 97% because the cut rate score on that was 100%. I, of course, blew a gasket. I called the then state director of career and technical education and I said to her, God forbid you get cancer tomorrow, would you go to a doctor who had a 97% cure rate? And she said, of course I would, Darby. Why do you ask? And I said, well, that's not good enough to teach our kids. She said, clearly you're wrong. I said, check and call me back. She called me back the next day and said, you're correct. So now this teacher had to do a 500 hour remediation program that had to be reviewed by our principal and our staff. So again, taking time away from writing, writing grants, taking time away from other things, had to pay another $500 and go take a test. And then you ask the evaluator, and I, I evaluated these early in my career. You don't know if somebody passed or failed. There's like just arbitrary questions. So once you get through that hoop, you get a three-year teaching certificate. During those three years, you have to get 18 college credits, 15 in instructional methodology, three in either in English or speech or something of that nature. Then you have to take a praxis test. Then you have to take another 30 credits and two other praxis tests. And, and we think that our teachers need to know how to read, write, and do mathematics pertinent to their field. A machine shop teacher can do mathematics probably better than most anybody out there, okay? But we don't take a math teacher in our high schools and make them take an ASC mechanic test, do we? Because if we did, they would probably fail. And that's exactly what we're doing to career education teachers. I actually lost a student, I lost a teacher, wonderful welding teacher, young guy, went 1.2 miles down the street from my school to teach the same subject matter he was teaching in my center to college kids at CCAC with no additional training required. Same health care, same pension system, same salary, less teaching responsibilities. And we in career centers see this, at least in Allegheny County with the regional centers. I don't know if this is by design or not, but we're all sitting next to a CCAC campus. So they steal our teachers because they know this. And, and I think that Again, it's, it's a legislative priority for us. We're gonna be coming to you. We certainly hope that you'll listen with open ears. We do not wanna reduce quality whatsoever, but we wanna make sure that the things we're asking these subject matter experts to do 
makes sense. That nurse with a master's degree or a doctorate degree who can teach people to be nurses at the post-secondary level aren't qualified to teach kids how to go down that path. Same with our doctors of physical therapy um, who can teach doctoral level courses but they can't teach in a secondary school. There's a disconnect there. And, and I, I, I'm dominating this question because I'm passionate about it because I've lost so many staff. I, I might have had a feeling that you had. <laughs> Senator Williams and I have had this conversation before. Uh, we really need some help and we're really we're going to be coming forward very soon with with some recommendations that we hope um, will will really help um, to get that. We really like that mentorship internship kind of model that some other states utilize. And when you look at every state around us. Uh, our, our career teachers have to do significantly more. And if it were things that mattered or really made them significantly better instructors, uh, we would be all for that. But making a welding teacher take a geography class doesn't make them a better welding teacher. Angela, do you have anything to add? Darby covered it well. The only thing I would add is that you're asking that many of them to take a pay cut go to school with many schools, no reimbursement also. And in interviews, after we have that final conversation with HR, people are like, <laughs> no, thank you. So to have really good quality teachers, that process does need some support for change, for sure. Thank you so much to both of you. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Rothman. Uh, thank you. I, I, I really don't have any questions. Just a comment. Thank you so much for being here. And um, I have two um, CTs in my district. One is um, a co it's co-located with the high school at Carlisle. It's an amazing uh, place and you walk down the hallway and you can smell the culinary arts and you can smell the, uh, the, the, the sawdust and the construction area and the auto mechanic stuff, but it, it, they've been able to use that co-location to attract students to say, oh, I'm gonna go take a course in, um, in one of the programs. So I appreciate that. And then I have um, Cumberland Perry Votech, which um, like, you've talked about has a waiting list of people to get in, young kids to get in. So uh, I'm glad you talked about the stigma and removing the stigma. Uh, when I went to school, uh, it really was. It was general college education and then the other kids, it happened to be most of those other kids now own their own businesses and uh, are all doing very well. So uh, I'm glad you, you pointed that out and look forward to working with you both to, to improve the system uh, and to make sure that uh, we, we put as much emphasis on CT as we have on college prep or any, anything else, so thank you. Thank you, Senator. Thank you. Uh, Senator Miller. Thank you, thank you both of you for testifying today. Uh, recently toured the Digital Foundry in New Kensington with Senator Pittman um, and was also at the Innovation District in downtown Pittsburgh. Really impressed with the innovative environment, trying to replicate both back in the Lehigh Valley. Uh, just want to see what your, your thoughts or what you guys are doing for supporting entrepreneurship uh, in, in both, you know, in, allowing people to start their own businesses if they don't want to go you know, into a different career? So every one of our uh, career majors has a unit on just that. Uh, and you know, as, as uh, the senator just stated, uh, we have a number of, of kids who've come through who are making a lot of money having their own businesses. And you know, I often uh, refer to heating, ventilation, air conditioning when you're talking about it's, it's a very easy area to buy a van and be a one person show and make an awful lot of money, right? So we do hit that in every one of our career majors. I'm sure you do as well, Angela, in your programs. And we have a lot of kids who really do well with that. Um, and you know, one thing that I wanna make sure that I didn't come across as being anti-college, because we're certainly not. Um, I believe every one of our children need to go on post-secondary to be highly successful. Sometimes that might be a business degree to open that small business um, or whatever it might be. But more often than not, that's a technical school or a community college um, where, where the kids become very successful. But you look nationwide, statistically, only a third of students nationwide that need a bachelor's degree or higher, a third. That's every physician, that's every dentist, that's every attorney, you fill in the blanks but we routinely send in the high 90 percentiles to four-year degree granting institutions. And then we scratch our head and say, how does student loan get debt get to be where it's at, right? So um, to answer your question, yes, very much so. 
Um, same thing as Darby said, except for I'll say we also, and I'm sure Darby does also, we focus on those career, PA career education and work standards. Mm -hmm. And there's the last, there's four buckets, and that last bucket is specific to entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. And we make sure with our career counselors, the students go through those standards and are able to figure out if that's the path they want to take because every student has to have a plan before they graduate and that is a confirmed plan. <laughs> so we get the proof and make sure they all have a plan and an e-portfolio before they leave. And some of our students have chose entrepreneurship. You saw the one young lady in cosmetology and we were able to get her set up. It just so happened we were also able to get her um, equipment donated from one of our local salons to start her salon so we talked about equipment and things not only do we get it for the schools but we try to get it for those entrepreneurs who want to start their own business too thank you what well, one, one more quick question um, I'm sure you're familiar with the court ruling recently that so they were unconstitutionally funding education across the, the Commonwealth uh, and one thing that the, the courts uh, opinion the judge's opinion was that we're um, you know, the adequacy target and making sure that we're adequately funding. And I heard that in your, the funding, you're spending a lot of it on special ed and other things and that there's a big gap there. And, you know, if you want to send a message to, to companies and more importantly, families to, you know, put down their roots in Pennsylvania, we have to fill that gap. And is there a way that you quantify um, that gap in terms of need for investment for those turning, so we're not turning away students from programs or not opening up programs that would be beneficial to attracting companies? I don't know that I could quantify a number right here on the spot, but what I can tell you is as long as those costs are put on the backs of school districts that are already struggling, uh, expansion's just not going to happen. It's not because they don't want to. It's not because they don't care about career and technical education or, 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 or the kids that attend it. They have to take care of home first. Yep. Understood. Yeah. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, Deputy Secretary Delgado. Good morning. Um, Backtrack a little bit to Keystones, right? Keystones have different pathways to graduation and CT I believe is three, number three for pathway for graduation. Um, have you seen an increase in your enrollment? Because if enrollment increases and you have more teachers and more costs. So with the graduation requirement and CT being allowed to be used as a graduation requirement, have you seen an increase in your enrollment and then what percentage of your kids in your school districts are graduating and meeting that requirement based off of the CTE requirement? Um, I think CTE across the Commonwealth has seen explosive enrollment growth. Um, I don't know that it can be attributed directly to the alternative pathway you're speaking of. Uh, we certainly have a few handful of kids that that does impact, uh, but but I don't know that we could quantify a lot to that. I would agree, but I would say that we are grateful for that alternative Absolutely. pathway for graduation because um, many of those students are utilizing um, that alternative pathway. Thank you. Representative Isaacson. Hi. Um, I know we are so over time, so I'm going to be really quick about this because um, I'm sure that we tend to all go on and on. Getting back to our... our um, funding formula issue that we have here. You spoke about, um, Dr. Copeland, about you taking on special ed children, but the money stays with the school district. It doesn't come to you. Is that because of the hourly amount of time they're spending with you? Is it under and the school district gets to keep it? Because I know with charter schools, the special ed money goes with the kid. Um, and so I didn't know if that was at a time of attendance issue, but also just all around, what I've taken from both of your testimony today is that we have this great opportunity of CTE in access in school districts across this Commonwealth, but the CTE educational experience is more costly um, implementing while desperately necessary, desperately needed to keep higher ed costs down, debts for people, get a pipeline. This is what we are supposed to be doing in education is producing the pipeline and making sure everyone is trained. This training costs a lot more than the basic education 
from what you're testifying, and I just want to make sure I'm correct, because when we put in, when we have to come up with a formula, knowing that this component of the education system exists and is an increasing cost to districts, we need to know that so that it's part of the weight. So um, the homeschool district being the local education agency, the LEA, is responsible for special education services for their children. That being said, when their children leave the home district and they get on a bus to go to the career center, um, their needs don't stop. It's much, much the same for mental health. It's much the same for safety, right? Um, but I'll use my school again as an example. Over 1,300 children, nine instructional assistants for 16 programs. Many programs have two or three teachers. 40% special education rate, um, and those nine instructional assistants help all students, not just special education students. So if a child needs more help than we can provide, the school district may have to send a wraparound aid from a school district, which takes basically half of a full-time equivalency to send them one person, and it becomes very, very costly. Again, it's not that they don't want to support their children, um, and it's not that, that um, they, they want to hold back. It becomes a pie again. It comes down to the dollar and, and that piece. So Perkins funding uh, and its infancy was really to help get more equipment to modernize programs. But as the special education percentages have increased, the career centers have had to utilize that money to add additional aids. You know, one time I had five instructional aids. Uh, but every time your enrollment goes up, there are more needs, right? So how do you balance that and you, and you pull from Perkins to kind of rob Peter to pay Paul, and now you're back to the point where we can't modernize programs? Did I answer your question? I, I, I'm not... Uh, yes. With, uh, um, Yes. Okay. So, base, so it's something that we do need to take into consideration yes. with regard to um, the, creating this funding formula because if this part of our education system is costing more than your basic, it's something we need to take in consideration regarding what's being offered. Is that correct, Ms. Michael? And then I'll stop because I know we are way over time. Thanks. Yeah, you're, you're definitely right on point. Um, we do need additional funding to support our PSE students in the career and tech programs, and I'll bring up our English language learners. So we've had to create brochures and we use grant funding to get, um, we could only do the top five languages for brochures and things to hand out to families to let them know about CTE. Departments are really small for ELA students and our city and our district, that number is growing by the day. We're getting more ELA students, so I'll bring them into the mix too. So you're right, we need more for PSE support and ELA students, English language learner students. Thank you. Um, if I could follow up on Representative Isaacson's questions, um, you know, currently in the funding formula, we do provide an additional factor for English language learners, and we provide an additional factor for uh, poverty. Can you give us an idea of what, on average, like uh, uh, any student, not, not, well, I shouldn't, nobody that has any other factors, but a kid that is weighted as one, which is basically a kid that has no other external factors, what's the additional cost of providing uh, career and technology training to that kid? So should they be at a 1.5? Should it be at 1.7? Should it be at 1.2? So over and above what would normally cost to educate that child in their home school, what what number, and, and you, don't have to, you don't have to give it to me right now, but what would that number be? If we, if we plugged a factor into the budget and said to school districts, for every kid that goes to a career, takes the career path and goes to one of your schools, you're going to get an additional 1.5, you know, instead of a one factor, you're going to get a 1.5 factor, and then mandate that that money actually go to your school. Um, I think that would be a, uh, a tough to give a one-size-fits-all question answer. If you look in Allegheny County, the cost per student for career education ranges from about $6,000 at Parkway to a little over 9000 in the regional centers. And there's a lot of things that go into that. Bond debt, uh, Beatty had a wonderful uh, expansion almost 
probably 10 years or more ago, but they, they have debt. Parkway doesn't currently have any debt. So if we do a building project, that number will obviously go up. And when you look at jointures, we have 12 schools. So we're cutting that pie by 12. Some of the smaller schools that I, I mentioned earlier might have three districts. So it would be very difficult. The one ask that, that from, from PACTA standpoint is that um, if that happens, that exactly as you said, that funding would be mandated to come to the career centers. So, yeah, and, and so that would be the uh, ideal. And look, I get there's going to be a range. There's a range with English language learner kids. Like one, we, we give a factor to that, and it might be a little bit lower, it might be a little bit higher somewhere. But on average, statewide, we can say this is a pretty good, at least, at least you're not going to go bankrupt if we give you that factor. Let's let PACTA take a look at that. Okay. And we'll go back to your yes. representative. And okay. Give, give you an idea, and I'm sure you can share it with everybody else if I get it to you. Absolutely. Okay. And then as a follow-up to that, then on the budget structure, you talked about presenting your budget to the 12 school districts and saying, okay, here's what it is. Are you all going to buy in? The other way to look at it, at least from my perspective, is to say, okay, I'm going to, I already give them school districts more money for English language learners and for kids in poverty and for a very, a special ed students and for various other factors. If I now say, oh, and by the way, there's also a factor for kids that are going to CTE. And I say to that school district, that kid, we know that that kid already has an ELL factor, a poverty factor, and a special ed factor. That kid may actually count as two students. So we're, we're supplying the school district with money to treat them as if they were two students because their cost is double what a normal student is. They're going to your CTE five hours out of their eight hours. They're staying in their home school three hours. If I mandate that that school pass five-eighths of that factor of two onto you, as well as the full factor of the CTE cost, and they show up and say, I've got a student I'm sending you, and you're going to get a student that you're going to get paid two times what a normal student gets paid. And because I've identified who the student is and that they're coming to your school, and instead of you saying, here's what my budget is, can you guys meet that? They say, here's how much money we're obligated to give you. Can you operate within a budget that way? Again, I think that's going to be very different at each individual school. Okay. Schools that have high special education populations, high ESL populations, perhaps the schools that have very low, maybe not. Yeah, but uh, that would, they, they would be bringing that factor to you. They would, be, they would be mandated to give you that portion of money. Like if you're at 39%, those kids didn't come from nowhere. Right. They came through a school district that got reimbursed on a factor that those, they had special needs students. You got to go back to those schools, and now you're saying there may be one school that's got 10% of the kids that are special needs, and the other one that's got, you know, 4% that's special needs, but they're sending them all to you, and you got 39%. So they're looking at it and going, oh, don't, don't blame me for the fact that you have special needs kids. Well, oh, not my. Uh, if they're sending them to you, it's their responsibility because we've already paid them for it. And I think um, you really shine a light on inequality in education, right? So oftentimes the lower socioeconomic districts that need the most money have the highest special education percentages, right? And, and asking them to send more of that money to the career center causes more problems for them at home. I, I get we're, we're trying to sort this yes. out. That's yeah, it. I get it. <laughs> yeah. I get it. So anyway, it, so if, I see both sides of the coin. Yeah. So if you have ideas about that and you can follow back up with so I'm not, I'm not going to put you on. Yeah. Cause that ultimately we're going to have to figure out what weighting factors are, how it gets distributed, who gets what. Um, I'm also a little bit disturbed by the fact that you will have to write grants all day long and to multiple departments. Like you're applying to labor and industry, you're applying to the Department of Education. You're, at some point in time, can we just say, like, I trust that you're not going to just go out and blow this on equipment that you don't need. <laughs> you're, you're, you're short the equipment you, you do need. <laughs> You know, like, and can listen, we just give you the money and let you decide how best to spend that? We're fine with accountability on the money. Just give us something reasonable to do. Yeah. Okay. Mr. Chairman, if I sure. may. Uh, can, can you clarify something for me? So we can look at what each school district spends per pupil. And really, that money should follow that student to the CTE. Are you in agreement with that? 
perhaps on the surface. I would need some more okay. clarification. So my understanding of that CTE subsidy is that it gives about an additional $1,000 per student. Do you see that additional subsidy? Well, again, when you look, at, for instance, uh, using the example I used earlier, if the CTC budget is $1,000, you divide the number of kids by $1,000, and that's the cost per student. And each CTC was formed under a jointure agreement when they opened in the 60s and 70s. And jointure agreements often will have some different formulas in how it works. There might be slots. So at South Fed School District, which we don't have slots, but let's just use South Fed because I'm looking at representative, they might have 10 slots. And their cost for those 10 slots is this, where they fill it. So it's on. not based on what they spend per student. No. So they could be spending 20000 30000 per student. You may only get 15 because of the negotiated agreement? It could be. In my instance, the cost per student at my school is $6,000 for a half-day placement, give or take a few dollars. Well, I, I mean, and it's I, and it's, and I'm and struggling that cost to is understand. Different. I mean, obviously, there's transportation costs, right? And mm -hmm. every school has transportation costs for students. I, what I don't understand is if you are educating that s student in some total, why that money in some total is not going directly to you. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Question. Thank you very much. I, I think we've opened a can of worms here that we're going to actually be working with for a while. So thank you very much for your testimony today. Thank you, Chief, for your time. And any questions, I'd be happy to follow up. And, and Representative, I will get that information to you. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Thanks. Uh, I'd now like to call up our next panel. Actually, it's time for us to question our next panel. So we're just going to go straight to questions. They don't even have to. No, I'm just. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes, if I could, we do have your written testimony, so um, if you can just summarize it as opposed to reading it verbatim, that would be very helpful. I did prepare them for our, our second panel is Dr. Robert Scherer, Executive Director of the Allegheny Intermediate Unit, Emily Neff, Director of Public Policy, Trying Together, Jenny Hergender, uh, Staff Attorney for Disability Rights, Pennsylvania, and Dr. Laura Ward, past president of the Pennsylvania School Librarians Association and librarian for Fox Chapel Area School District. If you could all stand quickly, and I'll get you sworn in. Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you will give before this commission will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? If so, say I do. Thank you. All right, uh, Dr. Shearer. Well, I will speak as quickly as I'm able to, and, uh, and I will certainly not just read from the testimony. So thank you, co-chairs, uh, Representative Sterla, Senator Phillips Hill, and obviously uh, Senator Williams for your continued support and all the members of the commission. Um, I am a product of Pennsylvania public education system. Having attended public school in two state-supported universities, I've spent my entire career, 27-year career, uh, in public education as a teacher, as a principal, as an assistant superintendent, and as a superintendent in five different school districts in and around Allegheny County. I'm also the parent of children who attended or did attend public schools. Uh, my daughter is currently a special education teacher in the Duquesne City School District, and my son is a high school senior who benefits from special education services. For the past three plus years, I've served as the Executive Director of the Allegheny Intermediate Unit, or AIU, one of the Commonwealth's 29 intermediate units. The AIU works directly with the 42 Allegheny County School Districts outside the City of Pittsburgh. IUs have no stake in basic education funding as we do not receive those monies directly. However, IUs are, do serve as liaisons to the state and federal governments on behalf of their member districts. So I'm providing this testimony in part in that role as well. The term intermediate unit describes where IU sit in Pennsylvania's public education system between the Department of Education and the 500 school districts that we serve, but not so much what IUs do. The AIU's mission is to advocate and advance equitable opportunities for every learner. Um, my written testimony does highlight some of the services that we provide, and you can certainly read that at another time. So as the commission's name suggests, it focuses on basic education funding, or BEF which plays an important role in influencing whether the Commonwealth's public education system is adequately and equitably funded. 
Even after the large increase in BEF for 23-24, only a quarter of the funding is distributed through the student-weighted funding formula enacted in 2016, commonly referred to as the FAIR funding formula. The remaining 75% of BEF is the base amount equal to each district's allocation during the 13-14 school year. This means that the allocation of the lion's share of BEF currently really bears no resemblance to current population, student needs, etc. But simply running all BEF through the FAIR funding formula is not a viable option. Any change in funding methodology will increase revenue for some districts and decrease it for others. In Allegheny County, most districts outside the city of Pittsburgh would benefit from such a change. Still, some districts with significant challenges and student needs, including Clareton, Duquesne City, South Allegheny, Steel Valley, and Wilkinsburg would lose BEF under the FAIR funding formula. Meanwhile, some of the county's better resource districts would receive windfalls. Moreover, some of the districts that would lose BEF could not realistically offset such a loss with an increase in local revenue. A prime example is the South Allegheny School District. Nearly two-thirds of the district's students are eligible for free and reduced price school meals. Allocating all current BEF through the FAIR funding formula would cost the district about $4 million out of its $28 million budget. Making up $4 million would require a property tax increase of about 40%. Even if the district were willing and able to raise such an amount through property taxes, it would take the better part of a decade because of the limitations opposed by Act 1. The Commission must be wary of potential unintended consequences of these policy recommendations. And the term basic education funding is somewhat of a misnomer because BEF supports more than basic education. That is because other subsidies, including special education funding, are insufficient to cover the needs that they are intended to address. Special education is a largely underfunded mandate. Federal and state law require school districts to identify students with qualifying disabilities and to provide them with special education and related services in order to receive a free and appropriate public education. The percentage of students receiving special education services in the Commonwealth has increased significantly in the past decade, from 15% in the 9-10 school year to 18% in the 2021 school year. During the same period, special education expenditures rose 63.9%, yet state and federal special education subsidies to Pennsylvania school districts increased only 5.3%. As a result, districts pay for required special education services in large part with BEF and local revenue. Thus, an inadequate or inequitable allocation of BEF hinders a district's ability to fulfill all students' rights to an effective public education. I also want to highlight that a thorough and efficient system of education begins even before kindergarten. The Commonwealth offers two high-quality preschool programs to three- and four-year-olds from low-income families. Head Start Supplemental Assistance and Pre-K Counts. The AIU provides Head Start and Pre-K Counts classrooms in various parts of the county. Early childhood education requires more of an investment from the state, both overall and per enrolled child. On a per child basis, Head Start program operators have been flat funded for four of the past eight years, and Pre-K Counts received no per child increase for five years during the same period. The 23-24 enacted budget was the first in a decade to forgo both an increase and a per child increase for both programs. Like the cost of doing business or raising a family, the expenses associated with operating early childhood programs go up every year. In a tight labor market, the AIU and other early childhood education providers are struggling to attract and retain qualified staff at salaries supported by current funding. The General Assembly must provide reasonable annual increases in funding for early childhood programs. And while this commission focuses on one component of the revenue side of the school funding equation, it should consider the expense side as well. And let me provide two examples. One way districts can reduce costs and maximize educational resources is by sharing services with other public entities. The AIU is a statewide leader in offering shared services to districts. We currently help schools receive reimbursement for services covered by medical assistance. A number of districts take advantage of our business operations support. Five school districts utilize our IT services, and eight school districts rely upon us for marketing and communication support. Bills have been introduced in the House and Senate to incentivize school entities to enter into shared services agreements. These and other measures that encourage school entities to realize savings through streamlining non-educational functions are worthy of the General Assembly's support. 
Another area in which the AIU and other intermediate units have helped school districts conserve resources is cyber education. For many years, the AIU's Waterfront Learning Program has helped over 70 school districts to implement their own cyber education programs. Bills introduced in the House and Senate would incentivize school districts to offer their own cyber education programs by relieving such districts from paying cyber charter school tuition. Another bill would establish a statewide charter school tuition rate that is much closer in cost to services provided by the AIU and other intermediate units uh, than current cyber charter school tuition that is paid. Such measures would afford school districts meaningful financial relief. These are just a few examples of reforms that could help school districts maximize the extent to which available resources are devoted to student services. On behalf of the AIU and our 42 member school districts, I thank the Commission for the opportunity to share my perspectives. I'm happy to answer any questions or provide other information that the Commission may need. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Neff? Can you hear me okay? Hi. Thank you, uh, Co-Chair Sterla and Co-Chair Phillips Hill, Senator Williams, and the rest of the Basic Education Funding Commission for the opportunity to provide testimony focused on early childhood education. My name is Emily Neff. I'm the Director of Public Policy at Trying Together. Trying Together supports high quality care and education for young children by providing advocacy, community resources, and professional growth opportunities. We support the adults and young children's lives because we know the interactions with parents, caregivers, and early childhood educators are the cornerstone for healthy child development. Trying Together is a principal partner of the statewide coalition Early Learning PA, which includes Pre-K for PA and Start Strong PA. Often early childhood is characterized as only pre-K, and while my testimony will focus on primarily three and four-year-old pre-K, it's important to note the early childhood continuum is considered birth through age eight. The federal Every Student Succeeds Act envisions a pre-K through 12th grade continuum, encouraging alignment in early childhood education. In Pennsylvania, the early childhood education certification is for pre-K through fourth grade, which is aligned with research-based or developmental periods for children, and we have a continuum of early learning standards here that build off of the skills beginning with infants that go through second grade. And this is because we know early learning experiences are cumulative and serve as the foundation for all future learning. The benefits of high quality early learning reach their full impact when children continue in high quality developmentally appropriate early elementary school experiences beginning with that transition to kindergarten. And through our work with Hi5, which is led in partnership with the Allegheny Intermediate Unit and the United Way of Southwest PA, we engage with the 43 school districts in the county to support effective strategies for smooth transition. It's a very, can be a difficult time for families during that transition from that birth to five space to the K-12 space. And we talk to a lot of kindergarten teachers and elementary school principals who will share. They can tell when a child has attended high quality pre-K. They come with the basic um, social, emotional communication skills, following simple one and two step directions, knowing how to interact with peers, express their needs. And this helps them begin to, be, to master those core academic skills to have children ready to read by third grade. As one part of the early care and education system, pre-K is offered in various settings, known as a mixed delivery system. This could include child care centers, home-based providers, public schools, and the options for a mixed delivery system offer parental choice that meet the needs of families. For example, a pre-K program could run for as little as three hours a day, as long as six hours a day. I think we all know that doesn't align with most families' working schedules. And so a family may need a longer day and choose to send their child to a pre-K program offered at a center that could have wraparound services before and after care to supplement those pre-K days. Or a family could have a few children who are in elementary school and one drop-off and pick-up location is what's convenient for them and a pre-K program in an elementary school is an important choice for that family. It's a complex, early care and education is a complex market and system. It's mostly private pay with families paying as nearly as much as their rent or mortgage. And while Pennsylvania does provide income eligible families with public funding, there's still a great deal of unmet need for families and the reimbursement rates don't cover the full cost of care for early learning programs. 
We're here today at Westinghouse within Pittsburgh Public Schools, and I want to highlight Pittsburgh Public Schools as a great example of providing a mixed delivery system. There's an early head start here at Westinghouse. We heard Dr. Walters reference 85 early childhood classrooms throughout the district uh, in about 41 of the schools, and serving 2,300 children from infancy through five years of age. These include early Head Start, federal and state-funded Head Start, pre-K counts, and some tuition-based. In addition, they have formal partnership agreements with 26 different child care programs throughout the city that are able to provide that extended day programming. The early childhood programming here is funded through state, federal, and local sources. And nearly 79% of children who are eligible for public pre-K receive services within Pittsburgh Public School District. Unfortunately, not all children have access to high-quality early learning experiences. Statewide, there are 65,922 eligible children who are attending high-quality publicly funded pre-K, while more than 87,000 eligible children are unserved. It's estimated an additional 4,364 pre-K classrooms are needed to serve the remaining eligible children. And across the state, there are currently 350 school districts without a public pre-K program. And while schools alone cannot serve all pre-K aged children, they play an important role in the mixed delivery system to expand access and more resources and funding are needed. The possibility of including pre-K funding in the basic edu education formula could be one piece of a puzzle to expand access and ensure adequate and equitable education beginning as early as preschool. There are currently 11 states that do include pre-K in the school funding system. It varies across the states that do incorporate pre-K, but all fare better in the measures of adequacy and equity for their children. And the states, some states that use the pre-K-12 formula also administer a pre-K program that is not fund, fund, formula funded, like we have so, many current, uh, so much current infrastructure here to do. And so before I close, I want to I touch on a point that I think is a highlight that Dr. Shear touched on, the difficulty of hiring and recruiting staff right now with the early, in the early childhood field. Another key ingredient for high-quality pre-K is a skilled and stable teaching workforce. And currently, we are facing a staffing crisis that seems to just keep getting worse. And this is due to low wages. We know that investments in recruitment and retention of high-quality edgers Educators, by increasing compensation, are investments in families and children. More teachers means more classrooms, and more children have access to that opportunity. Currently, the, the average across the state is $12.43 an hour. That's under $26,000 a year annually. And I was struck by, you know, it's great to hear that CTE students here at Pittsburgh Public Schools are able to make, um, uh, Miss Angela Mike shared, uh, I think it was $16.50. That's $4 more than what the typical early childhood educator is making. And so I appreciate this opportunity to testify and to sh share more about the early childhood landscape and this potential um, for pre-K to be included. We have the infrastructure here in Pennsylvania to work towards providing every child, regardless of race, ethnicity, geography, or income, access to high quality care and education. And we, because we know these high-quality early learning opportunities are the base for all future learning and skill development, we'll know to ensure that all children in our state will have this opportunity to start strong, succeed, and thrive beginning as early as pre-K. So thank you to the Commission for your dedication throughout this process and for your consideration for, of early childhood education as you review the basic education funding. Thank you. Ms. Hergenreeder? attorney at Disability Rights Pennsylvania. Disability Rights Pennsylvania is appointed by the Commonwealth pursuant to federal law to serve as the protection and advocacy organization for Pennsylvanians with disabilities. In addition to providing legal representation and advocacy to individuals, we're one of few organizations in the state that families of students with disabilities can call for free legal advice about special education. 
it's typical for us to handle hundreds of calls from families across the state each year. On behalf of Disability Rights Pennsylvania and the individuals we serve, thank you for soliciting our views on the educational needs of students with disabilities. There are both state and federal laws that impose obligations upon public schools to provide students with disabilities a free and appropriate public education. An appropriate education under the law is one that provides enough support for a student to make meaningful progress on individualized goals. The Individuals with Disabilities Education Act requires public schools to develop an individualized education program, or IEP, for each student with a disability and to educate students with disabilities in inclusive settings where they can learn alongside their non-disabled peers to the maximum extent possible. An IEP is a written document that describes the student's educational needs and how the school will meet those needs through supports and related services. Related services include things like physical, occupational, and speech therapy, counseling services, orientation and mobility services, school health and nursing services, and transportation, <clears throat> including any specialized equipment required to provide transportation. All of this takes significant resources, and federal and state funding cover a mere fraction of the cost. In 2020, state and federal revenue accounted for only 24.5% of special education expenses. The remaining percentage was borne by local school districts who had to make difficult decisions about how to shift funding away from other student programs in order to cover special education needs and costs. Following the pandemic, there's been an increase in the number of children who are eligible for special education services as well as the cost of those services. Staffing special education positions, including teachers, support staff, and nurses, has become more expensive due to the demand. According to a recent study by the Pew Foundation, 20.2% of students in Pennsylvania are enrolled in special education, the second highest percentage in the country. There is also an increase in the number of students with mental health needs who need support at school. Mental health is an essential part of overall health. We need more counselors and therapists working in school to support students and to help them manage in the moments when they may need it most. In closing, I'd like to leave you with a few examples of students with disabilities whose lives were directly impacted by their school's funding. The first example is an elementary age student with physical disabilities who uses a wheelchair. The student's elementary school was inaccessible to him. It had two floors connected by stairs, but no ramps and no elevators. The student was not able to access the second floor of the elementary school where some of his classes were held until the school district was able to pay for and install a stair lift. The second example is a student with autism who displayed self-injurious behaviors when frustrated, including hitting himself in the face and banging his head against walls. To keep the student safe and provide him with the instruction and support he needed to modify his behavior, the school paid for a specialized padded helmet, a one-on-one -on -one aid, an evaluation by a behavioral analyst, and additional training and tools for his teacher. The third example is a student with medical issues, including a seizure disorder, who required a one-on-one -on -one nurse for safety reasons. The student needed to be supervised carefully at all times, and a nurse was needed to administer his rescue medication within five minutes of a seizure starting. Recruiting and hiring nurses can be extremely difficult, especially in an under-resourced school. When this student's district could not find or hire a nurse, the student missed school, sometimes for months at a time. I hope you'll remember these examples as you move forward with the task ahead of you. Adequate funding is critical for schools to be able to meet the needs of students with disabilities as they're obligated to do. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Laura Ward. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Chairwoman Phillips Hill, Chairman Sterla, Senator Williams, and the members of the Basic Education Funding Commission. 
Thank you for this opportunity to share testimony today. My name is Dr. Laura Ward, and I am the high school librarian at Fox Chapel Area High School, and I am a past president of the Pennsylvania School Librarians Association. Not long after I became the school librarian, I found myself in an unexpected conversation. You see, on a June in-service day, I was finalizing my inventory, putting away my library decorations, and uh, putting away my book displays, when a woman came to my door. She introduced herself and thanked me for saving her daughter's life. She said if it weren't for me, the school librarian, her daughter would have never, never survived high school. Now, I'm sure you're wondering how a school librarian, someone who just checks books in and out all day, could save someone's life. But that's why I'm here. I'm here to share about how the school librarian touches students' lives every day. I don't know how or why, but over the years, I've had two other mothers come and tell me that I helped their children and use that same shocking phrase, that I saved their children's lives. I think back to these mothers and those students, and in all the cases, all I can figure out that I did was what I do for every student. I gave them a safe space in the school. And then I think, well, what if those students didn't have a school librarian at their school? A few years ago, I worked with alongside some PSLA members to survey PA schools to determine how many school districts don't have a school librarian. In 2021-22 school year, we found that 52 school districts across the state lacked a school librarian. That's 10% of schools, school districts. Based on the association studies, this number has steadily increased year after year. One reason is one reason is illustrated in the Aliquippa School District in Beaver County, a Title I school district. When I spoke with someone about Aliquippa, I was told they felt they didn't need a school librarian because they have a great public library. And I'm thrilled to hear that students live in a community with a good public library. Having a great relationship with a public library is encouraged for school librarians. Many of the Fox Chapel area school librarians have a fantastic relationship with Cooper Siegel Community Library and the Sharpsburg Community Library. Our goals are the same. We want to support the same people. And one type of library is not a replacement for another. Public, and public libraries and school libraries are not mutually exclusive. We need more of both. Now you may not know what makes school librarians uniquely qualified to work with kids in schools. So let me take a few seconds to explain. School librarians often have master's degrees in library science or another similar degree. But we also carry a teaching certification. We take additional coursework during our programs to learn how to become school librarians. In addition to taking classes on cataloging and research, we also take classes on uh, collection development, which takes a closer look at purchasing materials that align with our school's curricula. I even took a course called School Library Management to learn how to manage the day-to-day -day workings of a school library, including budgeting, classroom management, lesson and unit planning. Now, I'd like for you to take a second or two to think about your school library experience. Maybe it's your elementary library where you had beautiful picture books, or maybe there's challenging chapter books. Maybe you were poring over your, at your high school library, poring over your card catalog, looking for that right book for your research project. Maybe you're like me and didn't have a librarian at your junior high school. But our school libraries today are much different from our memories. Today, our school libraries are full of books, yes, but they're also full of ebooks and electronic databases, collaboration, tinkering, and of course, research. We begin teaching children how to find the best resource for the task at hand as early as kindergarten, and we continue to reinforce these skills every step of that student's academic journey. School librarians are the information specialist of the school, helping students and teachers alike. I get teased all the time by my friends and colleagues about saying that the school library is the heart of the school. And there's a chance that once I start talking about school libraries, I won't stop. But school libraries truly are the heart of the school. Many schools were built around their library as a central piece. The Fox Chapel Area School Library was remodeled to open it up to the school further. Leaving these spaces empty of a librarian leaves a hole in the heart of the school. Every student in Pennsylvania deserves a school library staffed with a certified school librarian. Too often school librarians are not replaced when there's a retirement and too many parents, students, teachers, and administrators believe libraries are irrelevant because students have phones, laptops, and iPads. Students have an innate ability to use these items, but they absolutely do not have an innate ability to know how to find the right information. Yes, they know how to use ChatGPT, but the reasons on how and why they should and should not use this tool is not, is not they don't always realize that. 
They can use Google, but they don't know that there are better places to find research online, like online databases. This is absolutely not the time to remove the information specialist from the school. Our school librarians in Pennsylvania are teachers, mentors, club sponsors, student assistance program certified team members, and so much more. We have the unique opportunity to connect with every student in the building, not like the classroom teachers who only get to see the students on their class roster each day. We see the Career and Technology Center students when they return early and need a place to wait for the bell. We host art shows for all students, not just the ones in the National Art Honor Society. We host family nights and Mario Kart tournaments. We make sure all students can find themselves represented on the books and the shelves of their school. The daily goal of a school librarian is to ensure that every child is getting what they need, whether that's simply the right book at the right time, maybe it's some clean clothes or food for the weekend. Sometimes it's even just a quiet place to eat lunch. School librarians help children to find the proper resources for success and work to ensure that all children find their safe spaces in the school. And sometimes we even save a child's life. Thank you for this time and allowing me to share about my wonderful and rewarding job. Thank you. You mean everything on the internet's not factual? Gee, oh man. <laughs> uh, questions from members? Senator Williams. Okay, um, thank you all for your testimony. We covered a lot of topics in this panel. Um, so I'm gonna start with um, Dr. Ward. Uh, in your testimony, your beautiful testimony, uh, you, you discuss the multifaceted role that school librarians play. Can you share a little bit more about how you collaborate with other caring adults in the building, school nurses, counselors, et cetera, to support our students? Sure. Um, I'll just, some of the things that I do, because that's what I'm most familiar with, but I can also share about my friends across the state. Um, the one school counselor and I, we started a club called Bibliotherapy, where we read books and we talk about how the characters overcame their, top, their challenges and struggles and how we relate and can overcome that. Um, so the school counselors are a wonderful resource that we're always working. Um, and I am on our SAP team, the Student Assistance Program, so I, and I am on there because I can connect with all the students across the school. Um, and on that, we also have the school nurses on our, on our, um, our SAP team. So she's, again, she gets to see the students in a different light. Sometimes we see them differently in the library or in the nurse's office or in the counseling office than teachers do in the classroom. So we get to know the students a little differently. Um, I, did, I just, I bully people into being my friend, into working with me. And I shove books at them. So I don't, I mean, I can just, I hope I answered that enough. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Um, and Dr. Shear, Jenny, whoever might want to talk a little bit about the experiences you've had in schools, about that network of, you know, caring adults that all go into making sure that a student's uh, IEP is met or their social emotional learning. Just can you talk a little bit about that intersection at each school? Sure. I, I think, you know, throughout my career, I, I've always been amazed at the fabric of support that all the educators in the building have worked together to build. So, you know, sometimes we look at students in a bucket, right? I know the, the you used the word bucket. I've reviewed some of the testimony previously, but, um, you know, we, we tend to put kids in buckets. They're a special ed student. They're a non-special ed. They're gifted. Um, and I think the best schools realize that every kid is unique. And so how do we all work together to figure out what are the supports that that student needs, that that student needs in, in school and outside of school as well? What are the opportunities that we need to create? So I, I think whether it's working with the librarians, the nurses, or anybody else in a, in, in a school facility, it's that idea that we all need to work together to figure out what works for that kid and then how do we scale that to the hundreds, in some cases thousands of students that might be in any one school building. I don't have anything to add to that. <laughs> I, would, I would like to say that, I, Dr. Lord, uh, Dr. Ward, um, what you shared is what I've experienced most recently in, you know, I sit on the school counselor advisory board for Shaler, and those meetings are held in the school library. Um, that's where they are. That's where everybody meets for that advisory committee. And then when I visited the school counselor, she brought me in for the day. Her programs were happening in the library on lunch break. 
like it was just really the hub for the school for, to connect those pieces of learning. So I appreciate, thank you so much. Thank you, Chair Phillips Hill. Thank you, Chairman Sterla. Thank you all for your testimony today. Thank you for um, referencing card catalogs because I don't think they exist anymore, but I certainly remember using them. Um, so thank you for that. I, we're really here to talk about the formula. So um, I think I'm going to key in on you, Dr. Shearer, because um, in your testimony, you discuss the impact of eliminating the hold harmless provision across the 42 school districts in um, Allegheny County. And of course, it would also impact a lot of school districts across the Commonwealth. Is it fair to say that you would not be in favor of eliminating the hold harmless provision relative to basic education funding? That would be accurate. <clears throat> okay. So some, and, and maybe Ms. <coughs> Hergen Reader, is that correct? Hergen Reader. Hergen Reader, got it. Um, so some of the testifiers that we've had before this committee have proposed merging uh, special education funding into basic education funding, creating really a larger formula, a larger funding stream. And considering that there is a hold harmless provision relative to special education, does this proposal to merge special education funding into basic education funding, does it give you pause? And from my perspective, I think it does. Okay. Um, because I think as soon as you start to just put everything together, you can't really parse out what's needed where. And that's a concern that I have, but I also realize that as soon as you create multiple buckets, then sometimes they become political footballs. Um, so you kind of need to figure out a way to eliminate that side of it so that doesn't come into play. But you know, just sort of pushing everything and then to a new revised formula I think can be somewhat challenging because and we also might start to see that the needs of our special education population in particular um, might be different and then are we going to go back and change that formula year over year to account for maybe shifts and things that students need today that they didn't need previously that would be a concern of mine okay any any thoughts <coughs> no okay um, have you contemplated at all how dollars would be redirected and how the hold harmless districts would be impacted relative to their special education funding needs so in terms of trying to come up with the magic number, right, and I know that, that idea of this, the adequacy targets is, is a big piece of this, I think that's really challenging because you really have to unpack what are all the different costs in different regions across the Commonwealth, and that's what's really challenging. I mean, I, I, I'm, you're, the shoes that you're in right now are incredibly difficult shoes. Um, so I think that this idea of trying to come up with the magic number that we can all point to and say that's what it is is going to be really challenging throughout this process because you're going to have such different needs, but you're also going to have students that have multiple needs, a student who's identified as special education and an English language learner. You know, sometimes I think we forget about that. We go back to the buckets and realize that there's unique needs that each one of our students have. Lastly, you mentioned that school districts can reduce costs and maximize resources by sharing services things such as payroll and accounts receivable and payable and then benefits management and technology services and communications and on and on and on. Um, do you believe that we should look to incentivize school district consolidations to achieve these results? Do you think we should further encourage utilization of intermediate units? Um, do you think there's both? Having served as a school board director, I know that there were times when the IU got me great savings. There were also times when I pulled programs back mm -hmm. or negotiated my own contracts um, and did much better. What are your thoughts? I think absolutely. So we know that there have been bills out there that have encouraged the utilization of shared services. We find that the member districts that utilize it can do what they need to do for a cost less than if they were doing it themselves or actually going to an outside entity. Um, so we think that's an area where we're going to see, we think, tremendous growth, growth over the next several years. Um, we currently are in two school districts where we run all the back-end office uh, operations, everything you mentioned. We have another one that's coming online in January, um, and we have a number of school districts who've reached out because the other challenge you have in some of those roles, like a business manager, 
business managers are really difficult to find anymore and the expertise that you need. And so you can rely upon an entity like us where we can scale that, that um, support up for all of our member districts. Um, and we feel that that's cost savings on their part, but then a level of expertise that in some cases they just can't realize on their own. Is there a way to incentivize that? Well, I think a lot of the issue for us has more to do with the startup costs, right? So to bring somebody online to do that, because if they're going to do the business, use that as an example, they have to move from whatever their financial system is into the system that we support through an Oracle Fusion platform. And so there's, there's costs to, to, to start that. And so we've been fortunate, some of the foundation community here in the Pittsburgh has helped offset some of those costs. So we haven't had to pass those costs back on to the, the school districts. The challenge though is, you know, we're fortunate here with some of our relationships. You wouldn't see that across the Commonwealth. So if there were incentives for whether it's IUs or other entities to do that, I think you then, those startup costs, which are always so challenging, you're able to, uh, to mitigate that. Thank you. Thank you very much to you all for your testimony today. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks. Representative Schwer. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, first of all, thank you all very, very much. Um, this was incredibly helpful. Uh, Dr. Shearer, I want to kind of go back a little bit, if I, if I may, to the hold harmless question. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, there are legislative initiatives, but I don't think any of them are gaining any legs to get rid of hold harmless. So let me start with that. Uh, even though I live in a part of the Commonwealth that is um, blowing up in terms of population, it's still not something that I'm uh, comfortable pursuing. I think, however, your example uh, 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 in Allegheny County of the school districts, the Duhains, the Clarions of the world, that would be it just just absolutely decimated with the uh, by the impact of Hold the Harmless versus the Fox Chapels, the, 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 the more affluent areas of Allegheny County, shows not an issue with hold harmless, but it shows an issue with adequacy and equity mm -hmm. amongst the school districts and how that's not reflected in our current BEF and it's not reflected in the overall spend numbers. So can we, is there anywhere that you can extrapolate or drill down a little bit further on the question of, of hold harmless versus adequacy or equity targets? Because I think that's really, at least that's what I interpret. Yeah, I, I think it's, 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 again, breaking down the quote-unquote winners and losers. If you were to fund everybody through the fair funding formula and to eliminate the base, right. you then start to have to look at, okay, how, what is the local effort and capacity of some of those districts to potentially get themselves where they need to be? And then Which maybe, was a massive part of the lawsuit. Correct. And so, so what does that look like in terms of then some districts don't need a windfall? Right, right. And, and, and so where could then some of those monies be shaved a little bit differently to support then the example that I provided with South Allegheny and a few others that are here in the region. So I think it's, it's looking at all of that a little more through a fine tooth comb, just like we look at students individually and personalize, you almost need to look at maybe what that looks like for individual school districts across the Commonwealth. Sure, the, the, uh, and, I, and I appreciate that um, because I think that that's an important part of it when we're talking about adequacy and equity in this, it, it, with this, uh, this commission, what we're talking about is uh, with a fundamental understanding that not every child is the same. Mm -hmm. Communities have a lot of children uh, that in some larger school districts have significant needs, but they're similar significant needs, English language learners, uh, special education, charter school penetration, et cetera, et cetera, versus those communities that are affluent and, and, and just have more advantages in their lives. So, um, so you're seeing, so what you're telling me is that even with the, I'm going to use the absolute wrong, uh, I'm going to try not to use the lo wrong language here, the uh, assumption that a school district, even a poor school district, is somehow overfunded in Allegheny County is a misnomer because it's not taking into consideration the needs of those particular students. I would agree with that. And okay. I think the challenge you also have, or, and, and you've talked about it in some of your prior uh, hearings, where you know, we, we're looking at the kid factors, right? But we're not looking at then the environmental factors, the buildings. And we know as these hearings have gone on that there, there's more and more of those stones that need to be turned over to really kind of figure out BEF is not just this, BEF then impacts all the other costs as well. And I, and I think that's an important part right there. And, and, and that goes back to my, God, I hate this. Um, my, my pushing back against the idea that we need to categorize everything we're funding in education. Mm -hmm. Because I think number one, it doesn't allow for flexibility and creativity in school districts. Number two, uh, not, and I, yes, I fundamentally believe it creates political footballs and leverage points that where they don't need to exist uh, at all when we're talking about educating our kids. But then, uh, but the lastly, it doesn't account for the, the changing nature of our school districts. Our, ki our districts and our schools are not static. We have transient populations that we have 
dramatic upticks in poverty, we have dramatic upticks in wealth, we have new developments, we have all of these sorts of things that change. And that's why that's where I hesitate from a policy standpoint, not just the fact that I'm a, you know, Harrisburg swamp creature. Um, I have a pin. Um, it's right there. It, but it, it, on the back side, it says Harrisburg swamp creature. Um, but not only that, but from a policy standpoint, I worry that we uh, that 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 would create a, a level of instability in our school districts. If you have, for example, a uh, a, a brand new public housing uh, development, a subsidized housing development that changes your 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 metrics, I don't know that if we don't put it all into one pile, or at least a number of things. And I'm not necessarily, I don't necessarily disagree on the special education side, mm -hmm. to be clear. But for all those other factors that we're looking at, the more that we bifurcate it or, or slice it up, not only does it become political footballs, but it reduces our overall ability to be flexible with our individual school mm -hmm. districts, uh, within the districts. And I think it's going to create more instability in the system, which is something I think we're all trying to worry about. So I just kind of want to put it out there. I appreciate the, mm -hmm. the, the conversation about uh, about hold harmless in particular, because I think there's a lot of misinformation about its actual impact on school districts, particularly on the eastern part of the state where I live. Thank you. Got it. Thank you. Um, I've got three questions, some more controversial than others, but um, I like to ask controversial questions. So um, I'll start out with uh, libraries, Dr. Ward. Um, Currently, we spend about $70 million on public libraries. And the court case said that not only do we need to worry about school libraries, we need to worry about public libraries as a part of the sort of extended education system. Um, and it seems to me that, and you can tell me from your experience if this is true, the poorer a school district, the more need there is for that kid to have access to a library in the summertime because there's not a shelf full of books at home, there's not access to the internet, there's not a neighbor that's got a shelf full of books. The only place that kid has access to the resources of a library are at the library in poor districts. In wealthier districts, those kids can find those resources in multiple locations. Would you agree with that assessment or not? Or Well, I think you have to also keep in mind that not every student lives in an area where they have access to get to a public library, even you know, whether it's a wealthy district or a poor district. Um, I grew up in West Virginia, and we would have had to get in the, drive in the car 10 minutes to get to the public library. Um, fortunately, my mom is a teacher, and I had lots of access at home myself. But you know, I think it just depends. Every student's different. Every situation's different. I don't want to just throw a whole blanket down and say, yes, poor districts, they need it. Um, because I, I believe everybody needs books. And where I currently live, we have a public library that's walkable, but I also gave books out to my neighbors during COVID, and I said, come to my house and get a book. So, well, so I get my, my, the root of my question here is, in the funding that we provide for public libraries, should there be some requirement that they at least collaborate with the school districts of the students that they serve uh, so that summer programs are available that can be those sort of enrichment programs necessary, whether, it, whether it's a wealthy district or a poor district. But is, should there be some, some sort of connection there, or are they just completely divorced from each other and we shouldn't worry about it, and so what the courts said we should, but who, who knows what the courts, you know. I don't, I don't quite understand. Like, the public library and the school library work together? Yeah, so, so in other words, we, we provide a separate bucket of funds for public libraries. The court said public libraries are an integral part of the total educational system. But I don't know that there is a, in some communities, sort of a, a cooperation or a recognition of each other. Or I don't know whether the school librarian says, yep, we end up closing up today. It's end of June. And the public library goes, well, here comes the onslaught of kids. And nobody, and nobody, and ne'er the two ever meet. Is, is there collaboration that there, goes on? Well, we encourage it. Um, okay. Absolutely, we encourage it. A couple years ago, I was a part of um, a task group that we met with public librarians across the state, school librarians and public librarians, and we worked together. And just a couple weeks ago, there was a panel presentation at the Pennsylvania Library Association for public libraries on that collaboration effort. Um, so we're always encouraging it. Um, but we have those 52 school districts that don't have a school library. So there's, that takes away that whole idea that there's no one for the public libraries to collaborate with. So you have that whole idea as well. Um, 
but I think it's always, I love when the, pub, the Sharpsburg Community Library comes to my school and shares what they have going on and I love bringing in and going down there and working with them. So I think it's encouraged, um, but we can't require it because we don't have school librarians in every district. Yeah, okay. I'm just thinking maybe I need to get the public libraries to at least call up their local school district and say, hey, you know, can we come talk to you? <laughs> Well, right. Yes, I agree. I agree. Well, I'm, that, that, maybe that's a way to get them funded is to actually say we're going to, you know, make this part of the system. Um, so that's my easy question. Um, now I'll get to um, Dr. Shearer. Um, so you talked about the, the base part of the funding formula, which is about 75 percent of the funding formula. And I've talked about this and, and I, I, too, agree we should not be touching hold harmless and all those kind of fun things. But it is perhaps, it is based on the most inequitable formula of funding schools that existed. When it occurred, when we locked that in, in 2013-14, we were considered 51st of the 50 states plus the District of Columbia in terms of equity. So we locked in the worst inequitable system possible, and that's where we run 75% of our money through. And we've since added some level up funds. So it's probably not 51st anymore. It might be 35th most inequitable, you know, just guessing. But needless to say, that's not where I want to be. Given that the fair portion is pretty dynamic and school districts have said, hey, that's, you know, really scares us. We like the stability of the base portion. Would it make sense to make that base portion fairer add more level up money, figure out some way to get it so that at least it was maybe the 15th most inequitable funding system in the nation, and then say, okay, we'll lock that in again at a new level, 2023, and at least it's close to being fair instead of the worst in the world. Does that, does that? Well, I'm not real excited about being 15th out of 50, but uh, yeah. it's, a better, it's a better place to be. So, and I think it's looking at it two ways. So, so number one, I, I always caution, you've got to run the numbers, right? So anything you do differently, how does that impact 500 school districts? Because some well-intended thought around a new formula or adjusting the base or smoothing out some of the, the items of the fair funding formula with acute poverty and things that really kind of create some of those cliffs, I think that's important, but you have to then run the numbers to see where it is. But again, back to my testimony, it's, Yes, let's look at the funding side, but let's also look at the, the, the expense that's side right. because even when we add more money, if it's just leaking out of the bottom, that's a problem. And, uh, and so we need to be smart about then some of the things, like I mentioned, maybe cyber school tuition is something that impacts all 500 districts, and, and that's something to at least save some costs that, uh, moving forward. Yeah, I, th I think we could save somewhere between $500 million and a $1 billion a year if we actually fixed that funding formula and put it back into public education. But... Um, so now my final question, um, Ms. Neff. Um, boy, I love the idea of having K-3 and K-4 be part of the basic ed funding system. Uh, and you said there's 11 states that do that. Um, and I'll, I tell this anecdotal story. My uh, daughter and her family live in District of Columbia. My grandson just turned three. He started public K-3. That family saved around $17,000 this year that they can now use for a down payment on a bigger house, pay off college debts, you name it. Everything we've said is the American dream that young families ought to be doing instead of spending $17,000 to send a kid to what may have not even been a qualified pre-K program because the people were underpaid, they might not have had the educational attainment levels necessary for what we consider pre-K counts or a, a, a Head Start program. And we know they were actually underpaid because no one in those systems is making enough. Can you just elaborate a little bit on like how, you, you gave me some numbers in terms of how many slots there were. Are, is there statistical information out there of how many kids we would expect to show up in a voluntary program, because I know some parents will go apoplectic if they say, hey, you know, give us K-3, you know, I'm not sending my three-year-old away, you know, 
Um, and there's also the issue of the people that already provide quality K3 and K4, and I would, I would encourage us to use those facilities because otherwise we don't have enough facilities. In fact, enhance those facilities and give them full payment for all of those kids that they have. Can you tell me how a system might work that, you know, and what the numbers are involved with that? I can try to start. Okay. That's that. <laughs> uh, so I, I think what I want to come back to is, well, I want to acknowledge that we hear a lot, life becomes a lot easier for families when children enter kindergarten. A lot of income, you're able to, you know, move around, like, as you mentioned. And it, it's a really, when we think about this, families with young children tend to be at the, they're not making them, they're at their lowest earning likely as well, they're younger families. So thinking about what that not only does for, for child development, but what that also does for the economy and for, for young families. And so I think that's a, that's a really important point to, to highlight and consider. And so I did highlight uh, a number of, I said 4,364 4, uh, pre-K classrooms are needed to serve the remaining eligible children. And so in a, if we were thinking like all, all threes and fours, that's an additional 6,451 classrooms that would be needed. So to your point, and the reason why highlighting a mixed delivery system is so important is that that would take, it would take school districts, it would take child care centers, it would take home-based programs, and then again, meeting what a family needs to, to serve all those children. I think we would have to do a little, you know, who, who would show up on that, who, who would show up if, to your point, I think we'd have to, to do a little more research on that, but you know, no, we know the demand is high for pre-K. We have uh, 38,000 children on waiting lists right now because we're understaffed across the state. 4,000 positions are open, and and that's that's with about that's about one sixth of programs across the state that respond to that survey. So think about what that number would be. So I think we we do have some numbers of knowing that we know the demand is high for pre-K. We just need to make sure. Uh, the you know resources investments are there that we have a mixed delivery system which we st we have a model for right now, and um, we have to make sure we're investing in our teachers. They are the center of quality. Many of the teachers who are in the in our programs who are making under twelve fifty an hour they are providing quality care uh, in education, but they're showing up every day because they have a passion for it. And so I think uh, continuing then to talk about that pipeline, that supply of teachers is also going to be a critical piece when we think about the investments to serve more children. Okay. One, one final question on these, along these lines. You mentioned the fact that we know that kids that attend pre-K show up qualified in first grade. Is there, are there any studies that have shown like what the cost savings are to school districts to actually have kids show up ready for first grade versus having to start with you know, a majority of their kids behind the eight ball and basically trying to catch them up to where they should be at first grade. Absolutely, yeah, there are, there are many studies, multiple studies out there that show that a child attending high quality pre-K, high quality early learning experiences not only show up with social and emotional but also academic skills. Right here in Pennsylvania, our pre-K counts program back in 2021 was studied and um, it found that children who participated in the program had higher levels of language and math skills and gained between four and five months of learning compared to their children that did not. And what that does is that then builds with a, with a you know, high quality early elementary experience that continues to build. And, and so there's research that shows reduced uh, grade repetition, higher, higher graduation rates, reduced need for special education services because they got those, they were connected to those services in the birth to five space. I mean, the research is, is out there, and there's, there's a lot of it. Yeah, if, if we can quantify that, mm -hmm. that also helps me convince maybe people that, while it will cost a lot of money to, do, to implement the K3, K4, there's some cost savings on the end, too. So we're already spending some money on K3, K4. There's some savings to be had. There's some great benefits for families. Or, I mean, like, I want to try and quantify that so we can say it's only going to cost us $2 billion. So what? You know? Like, that would right. Be and there, right there is some research referenced in my written testimony, and I'm happy to follow up with more as needed. And I also okay. want to highlight to your point that the return on investment in early learning is, can range from, there's lots of different research on it, it can range from $2 to $17 for every dollar spent. So even the lowest amount, you're still doubling. You know, you're still getting back what you invest, double, two times over. So it, it, is, it is a great investment. Okay, thank you. Uh, I understand we have a question from Senator Hughes. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, let me know if I'm being heard. Yes. Um, okay, very good. So um, I'm, I'm a big believer in 
uh, making sure that our students, no matter what age they are, are grade level reading and grade meta, grade level uh, computing. Um, if if there's a struggle with that, um, then there's a struggle trying to engage in multiple other opportunities that may be available to them, maybe whether it be CTE or or whatever. Um, I would ask the panelists and and my 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 friend in the library. She doesn't need to speak. I'm a library person, so we're already together like this, okay? <laughs> but um, wh where would you suggest as we try to figure out um, how this, how to, to get to constitutionality and try to get to adequacy, um, where, where, how should we be, be prioritizing um, efforts around uh, making sure that our students, no matter what, what grade they may be in, um, are at grade level with respect to uh, literacy, the ability to read um, at grade level, and, uh, and mathematics, the, the ability to compute um, at uh, grade level. Where, where, where would you suggest we uh, place these in priority? I guess Not I'll, everybody I'll, I'll briefly works. start and just by sharing, I think the, uh, the stat that Emily just shared a few minutes ago is, is, is exactly what you're asking. You know, there is, there is evidence that when you have a high quality pre-K program, when that child enters school, their readiness levels are higher, they're able to not play catch up. Um, and so they're on grade level from the start. And I think that's incredibly important. So it's that piece of it. But then it also just goes back to why we're talking about this. If you don't have the resources to provide you know, literacy instruction to those, particularly those who need it, and we know how important it is, sorry, we know how important it is to make sure that you have, um, that, that you're able to read by, the, by third grade, um, but it goes back to, do the, does the school have the resources they need to ensure that the students can read by third grade? Do they have high quality teachers? Do they have the programs that we know are research-based that, that, that are effective for students? So I think it goes back to, do you have the resources to do that? And then do they come to school ready to learn? And then obviously, are we providing the, the, the specialized support for those who benefit um, from the provisions in an IEP? I will, I will always say invest early, right? I, I think that I referenced the PA early learning standards and when we think about those, that includes literacy and language skills, that includes mathematical skills. Starting with, starting with how you're working with an, an infant to a toddler to a pre-K, kindergarten, first and second grade and how those skills build on each other. And so I think that is, it's, it's so critical um, that, you know, we're really thinking about that. And we think about how an infant teacher might be, you know, talking to the child as they change their diaper. Those are, those are the basic literacy skills. That's the communication skills. And then as they start to recognize letters as they go through each of the years. And then again, they show up to kindergarten. They, they, they're able to, they're ready. They're, they know how to interact with the teacher, how to interact with their peers. They're ready to learn. They have those foundational skills that were set. And while we can be guided by uh, the, the continuum of those standards, what will never be replaceable is, is the teachers. We have, like, they are irreplaceable. And so investing early and investing in the early childhood educator to be there without them, we won't be able to, to serve more children. Thank you. I, if, if I could just add, and, and I certainly understand the early learning component of this, and, and I think the chairman has indicated that um, the uh, report did not address um, early learning. Uh, I think I, I think that's the reality. Uh, but what I want to make sure that we don't forget is uh, those students who are currently in our schools, who are middle school students, high school students, uh, who are not reading at grade level, not computing at grade level, and what responsibilities we have for them provide extra attention and extra support to make sure that they get there to grade level, that they get there as, as uh, uh, being grade level in ninth grade, 10th grade, 11th grade. When they graduate, we have far too, far too many students who are uh, not uh, reading and computing at grade level at the point of graduation. 
Um, and when you get into some of our CTE programs, I'm sure one of the things that I've heard in uh, a number of the folks who I've dealt with, um, especially in the, uh, the skilled trades, electrician, carpentry, plumbing, what have you, that a significant amount of time has to be uh, spent making sure that um, those skills are upgraded as well, in addition to learning how to uh, do carpentry, learning how to do um, electrical, learning how to do other work necessary for automobile mechanics and automobile repair, what have you. My, I guess my question goes to where I want to, the point that I want to highlight that we have a responsibility to those students as well. They, they cannot be left out of this conversation that we skill them up because they have suffered for their majority of their academic career in schools that have been unconstitutionally funded, inadequately funded, and this particular space has been left out. So I don't know if anyone wants to address that, the older learner uh, uh, aspect as well. Yeah, would any of you care to address that? I, mean, I think the, the idea being that if we can eventually get to a level of funding that we need to, to make sure that all kids are doing okay starting from K3, but it's gonna take us five years to get there. In the meantime, we've got kids that are in eighth, 10th, 12th grade that can't read at grade level, can't do math at grade level, and what kind of programs do we need to have for them in the interim at least um, and hopefully those numbers continue to dwindle as we start to fund education the way we perhaps should in a, in a constitutional way. Um, but meanwhile, you can't just write off another generation and say, sorry, too bad, you missed it. Yeah, and, and I think that, again, there's no, there's no answer to that other than the, the schools providing the supports that the schools providing the supports that they need um, for the students who maybe have not caught up as the time they're older. But it also goes back to, and it's outside of funding, you know, I think right now it's an exciting time in education because I just look at the, the Western Pennsylvania region. Um, we have a lot of school districts doing some amazingly creative things, engaging students differently because I think that's a big piece of this. Um, we have a learning ecosystem here that is really unlike anywhere else and it's how are you looking at the schools, engaging with libraries and, and engaging with all the other resources that are in the community to then find that spark in some cases which gets that student where he or she needs to be and understands why it's important to learn some of these things because now it's relevant to what they want to do. And so you're right, we can't just throw away the students who might be older in the system we have to make sure we're providing them every resource we can. But again, it goes back to some of the financial resources that schools need to do that. And, and I, I raise that, and, I, and, I'll, and I'll finish up here, Mr. Chairman. I, I raise that um, because there's a tendency to uh, leave out those older students, those older learners. Uh, there's a tendency to want to make sure that we talk about um, grade level by third and fourth grade because um, all the data indicates if we're hitting the mark at third and fourth grade um, that the rest of the academic career will soar. We have a responsibility to those students that have been left out, that have been in, a, in, in an inadequately and unconstitutionally funded school for their entire academic career, all right, from pre-K to K to first grade, and, by, and, and they've just been passed on for whatever reason, whatever me mechanism, whatever methodology has been utilized, by the time they get to eighth grade, they're not reading at grade level. They're not computing at grade level. And, and we have a responsibility to respond to their needs as well, as we make sure that we're doing everything for the early learners, which obviously I'm fully in support of, uh, but we, make we must make sure that we do not leave out those students at the older grade levels who have been neglected uh, for their entire academic career. And I just want to make sure that that's in the conversation and to the extent that the testifiers can provide any additional information to this commission that talks about how those there are ways to deal with that in an effective uh, process, I think that would be helpful. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. And I would be remiss if I didn't ask Senator Hughes, did they have a library at Abbott? Yeah, yes, they do, and I appreciate um, not only the uh, chairman's question, but his attentive to make sh attentiveness to make sure that in this commission hearing that that name was mentioned as well. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Are, th are there any other final comments uh, or wisdom to be imparted here today? Um, 
If not, uh, this is, concludes this hearing, and I will now, it, uh, the commission uh, stays at rest until the call of the chair. Thank you.